fell asleep. That's why you gotta use name brand now. You're gonna watch all the A Nightmare on Elm Street movies and explain them, bitch. Then I'll let you wake up, bitch. I think I had to watch all the Saw movies in this basement. Yes, that's why I picked it, bitch. I- I know! I'm just saying! Jeez. Sorry, bitch. I had a heart on this morning when I woke up, Tina. Alright, so the A Nightmare on Elm Street series opens on a truly horrifying image of a very messy workbench. And a man with severe asthma builds himself knife gloves that I'm assuming he's gonna use to chop up a salad later. Say your prayers, Simpson. Cut from there to a title card I'm sure would appall my graphic designer dad, followed by an immediate murder of like a tent. We then see a woman running in her underwear through what appears to be a wet Steelers player tunnel, probably trying to get away from the recently retired and bored Big Ben, when she encounters a laughing sheep. We also catch a few glimpses of some asshole wearing a fedora, probably on his way to meet Big Ben for a double date. Right. Anyway, somehow the woman, who's really more of a girl, ends up in a boiler room. You know how you're always ending up in boiler rooms in your pajamas? And then some more fabric gets murdered. Then she's attacked by a guy, and I think the synth player slips and accidentally hits some sci-fi sounds instead of horror sounds. <laughs> the girl wakes up and her mom comes in and is like, you okay, Tina? And Tina's like, yeah, I guess so. And the mom is like, well, you should trim your nails because you freaking shredded your pajamas. And then a creepy man walks in and is like, can you stop talking to your daughter, please? It's like 3 a.m. and I want to plow you. You know, because the French call 3 a.m. the plowing hour. Or like, le plowing hour. Cut from there to some girls jumping rope and singing a song that begins with one, two, Fred's coming for you, which is very specific. Then Tina hops in a car with some cool kids, including Johnny Depp dressed like a crypto bro and his girlfriend Nancy. Tina confesses that she had a pretty scary dream last night and then this guy Rod sneaks up behind her and confesses that he is appropriately named because he has an erection. But then Tina says that Rod has a small rod and he says, Up yours with a twirling lawnmower. He leaves and Nancy says that she had a nightmare too and Tina says maybe that means there will be an earthquake. Maybe. Hey look, a weird head hanging from a shelf. So now it's night again, and Tina has convinced Nancy to spend the night in case she has a nightmare and or an earthquake. Johnny Depp is also there thanks to an elaborate ruse involving airplane sounds. Right, I'll call the police. Apparently Tina's mom is out of town, which is why this is all possible. Oh. Tina and Nancy realize they both had a dream about a guy with a weird face and finger knives, but like everybody has dreams like that. But oh no, they hear something outside and they send Depp to go look and he's like, yeah, I'm gonna go beat it up. But what does he think is out there, his wife? Or would his wife beat him up? Where do we where do we land on that? Somebody it doesn't matter. Apparently, the question is irrelevant because Rod is out there and he wants to show Depp his rod-like erection. He's just he's so hard. Rod's also carrying a prosthetic hook hand for no apparent reason because I guess that's just the thing high schoolers carry around sometimes. And then when Depp acts annoyed, Rod pulls a knife on him because I guess high schoolers are lunatics sometimes. Rod then essentially kidnaps Tina and has sex with her, which is weird, but I guess they're dating? I hope. Then Depp, getting carried away in the amorous moment, propositions Nancy, but Nancy says they can't uh. because they're not here for them, they're here for Tina. Specifically, they're here to listen to Tina and Rod go at each other like wild animals because high schoolers are great at sex, apparently. <laughs> this makes Depp say, Morality sucks. But like, what is even happening? Why would they not be allowed to have sex because they're here for Tina? She's literally having sex elsewhere in the house. Is it actually important for them to listen to the sex in case Tina falls asleep and has a nightmare somewhere in the middle of the sex? And is not having sex like the moral thing to do in that instance? If they did have sex, would they be even louder than Tina and that make Tina try too hard with her sex and then she'd pass out and have a nightmare? That must be it. Glad I could clear that up for you guys. Also cleared up, we now know who's gonna survive to the end of the movie and spoiler, it's not the girl getting plowed so hard she can barely formulate sentences. Jungle man fix Jane. We, I, I mean, serial killers hate premarital sex. I've heard. Anyway, once Tina and Rod finish with their guttural throat screaming, everybody goes to bed. In Nancy's room, somebody attempts to break through the wall like Ace Ventura out of Rhinoceros's asshole, but can't quite push hard enough. <laughs> 
Tina, for her part, wakes up and decides, Hey, I know I asked all these people to spend the night with me because of my terrifying nightmares, and I secretly sort of think they might be based in reality, but you know what? I think I'm just going to wander through the neighborhood in my pajamas without... Abroad. And during her floppy travels, Tina stumbles upon a man whose arms are a bit longer than you'd expect and who runs like a two-year-old chasing the neighbor's cat. It appears Tina will get away, but then the scary man pulls this classic trick. He says her name. So Tina stops, running from the man with the knife blades, and turns around. Then the man cuts his own fingers off and jumps her. Damn. He is clever. Rod wakes up to Tina thrashing and bleeding and getting thrown on the ceiling and shit, but Rod thinks fast and sort of awkwardly holds out his hand from like 10 feet away. And he kind of whimpers Tina's name a few times, like, like a goddamn superhero. And even though all the screaming and thumping still kind of sounds like sex, I guess Nancy and Depp are so, you know, finely tuned to what it normally sounds like when Tina and Rod have sex, they know something's going wrong. So they run in, but Rod is gone, and Tina is looking rough. The next day, the cops get involved, one of whom is Nancy's dad, who has evidently divorced her mom, bringing the number of characters from Broken Homes up. Two. They think Rod killed Tina, which is fair. But Nancy says she doesn't think so, and her mom is like, You don't think murder is serious? God, Mom! Obviously that's not what she meant. You idiot! Go home! The next day, Nancy goes to school despite her mom saying maybe she shouldn't. And now Nancy is dressed kind of like a crypto bro. Rod leaps from a bush and grabs her and says he didn't do it! And that he's not a fruitcake or something. I think you've got bigger problems than people thinking you're a fruitcake, Rod. And if you're so worried about that, you should probably consider putting on a shirt. You fruitcake? But then Cop Daddy and the other cops show up and arrest Rod. Then Nancy just kind of goes to school as if everything that just happened was totally normal. Bye, Rod! So now Nancy's in an extremely diverse English class, both in ethnicity and puberty levels. Like, how old is that freaking kid? How old is the kid behind him? Is this a dream? Anyway, they're talking about Shakespeare, which naturally knocks Nancy right the hell out. And she wakes up to see Tina in a bag. Nancy thinks that's kind of cool, so she follows the blood trail left by her bag friend. But in the hallway, she runs into a hall monitor who reveals a knife glove, but Nancy's not super worried about this either, it just sort of keeps walking. She ends up in the basement, and there are more space sounds, because I guess those were scary in 1984? The tragedy of the shuttle challenge. Then the creepy dude shows up and slices his own nipple open, which was definitely scary in 1984. He chases Nancy to the fattest beat 1984 had to offer, and the dude says, come to Freddy, which is presumably his name, and not like a local club where he's doing an open mic next week. Regardless, Nancy doesn't want to talk to him anymore, so she burns herself on a pipe and wakes herself up back in the English class and then she goes home because I guess you could just leave school in 1984. But like why would you? I always skip third period to go to Chipotle but that definitely didn't exist in 1984 so where would you even go? They don't even have Xboxes! <laughs> well apparently because there's no Chipotle or Xbox she goes to see Rod in prison which is almost as fun but unfortunately he's been given a shirt in prison so he's all shirted up and he's like oh yeah I had a nightmare about this Freddy fella too and Nancy says okay then she goes home and takes a bubble bath and despite her mother's insistence that hundreds of people a year drown in their bathtubs while asleep Nancy Nancy falls asleep and almost drowns in the bathtub after her vagina grows knives and pulls her under the surface that exact thing happens to literally hundreds hundreds of people every year and nobody's talking about it. It's in the newspaper. <laughs> They're all growing vagina knives and drowning. No one's listening to me. The town crier from 1984. Thankfully, her mom is a career criminal and or pervert and she picks the lock to the bathroom before her daughter is drowned by her sharp vagina. Nancy is convinced that she needs to stay awake now. So she takes these stay awake drugs. They're just meth, right? Call it whatever you want, but I know meth when I see it. And I get why she's taking meth and trying to stay awake. Everybody's doing it. But what's the long-term plan here? She can't stay awake forever. Not unless that meth is way better than the meth I've been using to stay awake so as to not be murdered in my dreams by some asshole in a fedora. Anyway. Depp sneaks into her room and mocks her for freaking out in English class, even though they both witnessed the aftermath of her best friend's insane, horrific murder like 24 hours ago. So maybe it's not that crazy that she's having bad dreams, but Nancy ignores her asshole boyfriend and comes up with a legitimately decent plan. She's gonna fall asleep and go looking for Freddy, and Depp can watch her and wake her up if she starts flipping out or bleeding from her bits. 
So that's what they do. But if she's lucid in her dreams enough to go find a dude, then why are things crazier? She's still just wandering around in her pajamas in her actual real neighborhood. Why isn't she riding a unicorn, sporting rocket launchers akimbo? Or if she doesn't have the power to do that, then why doesn't Freddy have that power? Also, also, if this is her dream, then why is Johnny Depp also in it? Is he awake or asleep? How is she talking to him? And is that getting to him in reality? Whatever, Nancy wanders around and sees some weird things and then Freddy starts chasing her. And I don't care what year it is, how could anybody find this music scary? Then Nancy's feet sink into some steps, so okay, that's like a dream hallucination thing. And Freddy and her eventually tussle and he really isn't significantly stronger than all these literal female children he's always wrestling. Eventually she's awoken by an alarm because Depp fell asleep. Then there's a weird cut and suddenly they're fully dressed and running to the jail because Nancy thinks Freddy is gonna murder Rod. She's not wrong because Rod's bed sheets evidently tired of, uh, you know, getting creamed on, sneak up and just hang him. The cops run in right as he's being pulled up, though, so... I mean, how long could he have been without air? Like, four seconds? Is that enough to kill you? It's not like he broke his neck like a real hanging. Rod's a wussy. Anyway, at the wussy's funeral, they think he killed himself because of his sadness over the whole murdering Tina thing, and the pastor says, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. But realistically, the phrase in this instance should be, he who lives by the knife gloves dies by the creamed bed sheets. Pretty sure that's also in the Bible. Nancy's parents send her to a sleep disorders clinic so that she'll stop waking up during lip hour and of course, she's attacked in her sleep. Upon awaking, her arm is inexplicably cut and she has a fedora now. The most inexplicable of fashion choices. This tells her that she can take things from the dream and bring them back into the real world. And all she brought back was a hat? I want a rocket launcher unicorn. Damn it. The next day, Nancy tells her mom, yeah, that dude is named Fred Krueger because apparently he's that unique type of asshole who puts their name on their fedora. And her mom is like, I'm an alcoholic and slaps Nancy. She tells Nancy to go to sleep. But Nancy says what I say every time I finish another episode of The Expanse and my wife tells me to go to bed. Go to sleep! She and Depp hang out on a bridge and he tells her that she needs some dream skills. And she's like, what I need to do is study the 1990 classic film that hasn't come out yet, Home Alone, because I'm gonna booby trap that spiky fingered son of a gun. He's a home security system. She returns home and her mom has apparently installed bars on every window in just like the past six hours. And meanwhile, I'm still waiting for a contractor to build the fence I paid for in August, 2019. Any day now. Nancy's mom invites her into the basement and explains, okay, yes, yeah, so I know Freddy. He murdered 20 kids and then he got off because of a technicality during the trial. So me and a bunch of other parents burn his ass alive. Look, here are his gloves. See, he can't hurt you in your dreams because mommy killed him. <laughs> Is it crazy that my mom and I had this exact conversation when I was in high school? Cut to Johnny Depp dressed like he's just asking to get fingered to death by a serial killer. <laughs> What a line. Nancy invites him over to try the same wake me up plan from earlier, but this time she's gonna grab Kruger into the real world with her so Depp can beat him to death with a baseball bat or Aww. something. Also, she's making booby traps. No, not that kind of booby trap, you perverts. Although then again, she does apparently want Depp to help her. Nailing the guy. So maybe it's both. Oh, hey, Dave. Yeah. Uh, 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 your mom, she's so dumb. I bet she- Went over to the security store. What? God! Oh, also Depp says that he's not a fruitcake. Fruit like, I guess that just meant crazy in 1984? Man, 1984 was fruit cakey. 1984. So, Nancy says, meet me at midnight, but Depp falls asleep again, like he's one of Jesus' disciples on the night he was betrayed. And as punishment, Depp gets sucked into the bed and explodes into a fountain of blood. Because that's how dreams work. Oh. Garden of Gethsemane would have gone very differently if disciples were exploding left and right. Believe you, me. Meanwhile, Nancy accidentally unplugs her phone, but it still rings. So she answers it and it licks her. Sure seems like she's asleep, but she never wakes up after this point. So like straight from there, she runs around setting booby traps and screaming at her dad to come wake her up at exactly 1230 because she needs him to grab Freddy now that her plan A is old faithful, but with corn syrup. Oh. Then Nancy tucks in her drunk ass mom who tells Nancy that she faces things. That's Nancy's nature, which I guess it's true. And then Nancy sets an alarm for 12.30 and she puts on pajamas? She's about to go battle a serial killer in a nightmare dream world and she decides she's gonna do it in her pajamas? Can she just not fall asleep in jeans or like a Kevlar vest? If not, 
Well, then that solves your falling asleep problem. Whatever, her jammies are so comfy she does fall asleep, and she looks for Kruger for forever and hears a lot of extremely terrifying sounds and gets chased around for a while until her alarm goes off and she presumably pulls Kruger into the real world. Oh yeah, there he is. They run around and she traps him with a few boobies like this sledgehammer in the gut and a literal explosion, which somehow still doesn't do enough to attract the attention of the cops, literally across the street. This is my house. I have to defend it. And eventually she locks Freddy in the basement and sets him on fire. Then she goes and gets her dad, but they see fiery footprints leading upstairs, which they follow to reveal an on-fire Freddy giving it to Nancy's mom. Must be 3 a.m. The dad thinks fast and covers them both with a blanket to put the fire out and, and, um, hopefully put out his knife fingers in his dick. Unfortunately, this transforms the mom into a drunken Disney's haunted house animatronic and she sinks into the bed. Then Nancy kicks her dad out of the room so she can talk to Freddy one-on-one. -on -one. Well, after he comes out of the bed sheet, of course. And she tells him that he can't have her power. She wants it back. You know, her dream power. Freddy is like, oh no, and he dissolves. And then we cut to the next day and everybody's shiny and happy and Nancy's mom and friends are alive, but then the kids are all kidnapped by Freddy Krueger as a car because obviously this movie is in the Transformer verse and Nancy's mom is sucked through a window. Sort of like the ending to uh, Friday the 13th, except it has no time to breathe and allow the audience to feel safe. It knows that you know it was always not going to end happy, so it just gets the obligatory, oh, actually the bad guy won ending over with as quick as possible so as not to waste too much film because the scariest part of this movie is its efficient use of budget only 1.1 million and with half of that budget probably going to freddy's gorgeous sweater terrifying you are way too wet. All right, well, how about I talk about ExpressVPN? You know, since if you go to expressvpn.com slash cracked right now, you could get 49% off a 12 month plan plus three months free. Oh, do you mean that VPN that keeps all your information super secure and also has servers in like over 90 countries and works on basically every device? The one and the same. Did you know that despite all those great things you just said, you can literally use ExpressVPN to watch movies and shows on streaming services like Netflix that are blocked in your country. Can you give me an example of how that would work? I totally can, but I don't currently have my account set up uh, and it's not running, so I'll just do it later with VO. I'll do it right now. All right, so if you get on Netflix in America, you can see, oh no, I can't watch Twin Peaks. That's my favorite show, I think. I can't, I can't know for sure because I've never seen it because again, I'm in America and we don't have Twin Peaks, but if you quit out of Chrome entirely, open up ExpressVPN, switch the country to Brazil, then go back, open Netflix, look for Twin Peaks, boom, it's there. Now you can watch all the freaky things, and it's literally, it's as easy as that. Wow, that's great. I'm going to sign up right now. Perfect. And I'm going to get a towel so I can keep things moving. How do you like that, man? Anyway, the second film opens on a school bus being driven by a kindly oh. fella and a scratchy title card followed by a metallic title card claiming that this movie is all about Freddy's revenge. A nervous, sweaty dweeb sits on the back of the bus and is mocked by a couple of hotties, by 80s standards, and they're presumably making fun of how his shorts are nowhere near as short as the other boy's short shorts. And then the dweeb tries to open the window so he can crawl out while the bus is still moving? Body fast. Then the bus driver just friggin' guns it. Within seconds, they're driving off-road through the Ohio desert. The bus screeches to a halt and it appears about to be eaten by a sarlacc, but no, it's just an endless pen of death with absolutely zero dentata, unfortunately. Oh. The driver naturally becomes Freddy Krueger and kind of freaks out Dweeb in the hotties, which is a great band name, but then we cut to a cut tomato. Oh. Upstairs, the Dweeb wakes up from what was apparently the wettest dream of all time. The dude, named Jesse, is absolutely friggin' soaked. Like, that dream must have rocked. More like nightmare on these sheets, am I right? Anyway, he gets up and adjusts his presumably very empty dick and heads downstairs where his sister offers some cereal, but Jesse is an asshole and yells at her. Or maybe he's just socially conscious because the cereal is called Fu Man Chews. Nobody likes a smart ass, buddy boy. What is that? Uh, AC, maybe? Me talking about that empty dick made the AC come on. Then a girl named Lisa shows up at the front door, and he's kind of an asshole to her. 
too oh. high. The asshole drives Lisa to school in an old convertible he calls the Deadly Dinosaur, which I'll tell you right now is a way better name for a horror movie. At school, Jesse and a kid named Grady get into a fight after Grady exposes Jesse's butthole to the entire student body. I guess his rocks off like this. It's no big deal oh. though. And they go hang out in the boys' locker room where an ancient janitor decides now is a perfect time to clean and or maybe see some exposed boy buttholes. And then Grady asks Jesse if he's from around here because I guess the public schools in the 80s sometimes included students commuting from the Amazon or something. <laughs> but surprisingly, Jesse says, yeah, I actually live nearby in the house from the last movie. And Grady's like, damn. That's where a girl went crazy after her boyfriend died. Anyway, then Jesse wakes up sweaty again, throws on what appears to be an inside out scrub top, goes downstairs, breaks some orange juice, and then goes outside to inspect a noise, leaving the fridge door wide open. Man, everything Jesse does is dickish. Outside, he sees through a window that Freddy is throwing shit into their basement furnace. So Jesse goes back inside and tries to hold close the basement door and yells for his dad. But unfortunately, Daddy can't help you now. Freddy asks Jesse if he could do some murder for him. Please. The next day, this science teacher slaps some meat on a table, and then Jesse gets attacked by the class snake, which makes the science teacher mad at him for some reason. When Jesse gets home, he attempts to hang out with Lisa, but his dad demands that he go unpack his shitty room, so Jesse stomps upstairs like a little bitch. He just starts throwing shit in disorganized drawers as a sick diss towards his dad. How do you like that, man? Then Jesse gets distracted and dances for a while and pretends this pop thing is his dick until oops lisa shows up and also his door has a sticker that says no out of town chicks i think jesse might be the most unlikable protagonist ever lisa offers to help him clean his room and like also probably his groin both because she has the hots for him and i think his perpetual wetness has apparently given him jock itch whilst cleaning the room not like jesse's schmegma coated foreskin lisa finds nancy's diary which briefly recaps the plot elements from the last movie there's another band name for you dave schmegma coated foreskin Oh, well, I don't like that. Da -da 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 -da. Anyway, now our boy is all wet. Except this time his whole room is wet and melting. Once again, Jesse gets up and goes downstairs and finds Freddy's gloves in the furnace. And once again, Kruger is like, no, really, can you help me kill people? Please? The next day, Jesse asks Grady if he ever remembers his dreams, and Grady is like, Only the wet ones. And Jesse's like, that makes sense. My dreams are the wettest in recorded history. It's like Katrina every night. And then at home, their pet bird goes crazy and then explodes. And Jesse's dad is like, Use a goddamn cherry bomb. Because that makes sense. Then Jesse gets wet again, but this time he decides to really lean into it and wander around in the rain until he finds a gay bar where his wetness will not be questioned and where he orders and receives a beer. I mean, what did you do when you were high school and couldn't sleep. Play video games? Losers. It turns out that one of the school's gym teachers is there dressed as a leather daddy. Leather daddy? Jesse's gimp teacher forces him to run laps and then take a shower, but while Jesse positively soaks his wet, nude, young body, Mr. Fifty Shades of Gay deals with some haunted balls. Eventually, he's grabbed by some jump ropes, dragged into the showers, stripped naked, and spanked in the ass to death. It's revealed Jesse is now wearing the Freddy glove, and that makes him scream like a woman. <laughs> This is a real movie that people make. The next day, it's further revealed, yeah, Coach died for real. It wasn't just a wet dream. It was a wet reality. This freaks Jesse out so bad, we cut to him wet in bed again. Then we pan down to his dick again, and also a dresser that's just wriggling with Freddy's glove. Oh. Freddy wants Jesse to kill his sister, but he merely wakes her up to show her, hey, look how wet and nude I am. The next day, Jesse and Lisa drive out to a power plant where Kruger used to work to see if Jesse can feel the connection. Thrillingly, he cannot. Oh. Jesse pounds some meth pills that are just so readily available in this universe and chases them with an ice cold Coke. It's no coincidence, this movie came out the same year they released New Coke. They wanted us to subconsciously think Coke was just as yummy as meth. And it, it worked. <laughs> Yum! We knew that millions would prefer it, and millions do. The next day, Grady, who's drinking like four milks, asks Jesse if he wants to hang out later, and Jesse is, predictably, an asshole. Shut up, Grady! Grady's been mostly nice this entire movie, but I guess Jesse is still sore about the whole butthole thing. Anyway, now there's a rager at Lisa's house, and her dad mans the grill, which is weird, and Jesse's having no fun despite drinking at least three different meth-infused Cokes. Lisa tries to cheer him up by hooking up with him and letting Jesse squeeze her tits way too hard, but then his tongue gets it's all weird and big, so he runs away crying. Oh. Elsewhere, Lisa's parents go to bed, so the kids turn this party into a party. Jesse jumps into Grady's bed and demands he let him spend the night, and specifically, Jesse would like for Grady to watch him while he sleeps, which is pretty.
pretty hot. And Grady agrees and then just goes straight to sleep because this is a world where no teenager can stay awake past 11 p.m. despite widely available and ingested meth. Anyway, Jesse wakes up really needing to shit and then also Freddy sort of busts out of his body like the worst shit, and murders Grady because neither he nor his dad can open the damn door. Then Freddy disappears and it's just Jesse sitting there covered in blood and probably shit and wearing Freddy's glove. He runs away though before the cops show up. Jesse goes back to Lisa and explains what's going on and she's like, dude, just fight him. She really takes it in stride that Jesse is not crazy and is in fact actually factually possessed by a dead serial killer. Fortunately, she is correct. Jesse becomes Freddy again and oh, uh, uh, outside at the pool party, everybody's wieners are literally catching on fire, but they still look pretty good. Help yourself, but yeah, so Freddy tackles Lisa and nibbles her foot a bit and she stabs him, but her heart's not really into it because occasionally Freddy whispers with a Jesse voice and then rather than kill Lisa, Freddy jumps through the door and disappears, except no he didn't because now he's running around ruining everybody's fun, sexy pool party. It's right around now that you realize, hmm, maybe Freddy Krueger isn't actually very scary at all. And then as if anticipating how stupid and shit he looks fully lit, Freddy disappears into a blast of fire for no reason. So here's a question. What exactly is Freddy's revenge here? In the first movie, you could conceivably make the argument that he was terrorizing the kids of the people who killed him all those years ago. But Jesse is brand new to the neighborhood. Even dumber, how does using Jesse to kill people count as revenge? What is he revenging? What is the end game here? What is he even what? I don't know. But Lisa tracks Freddy back to the stupid power plant where Freddy is hiding, again, oh. for no reason at all. And she encounters some dogs with baby heads and like an evil cat because there's no metaphor for a point or story here. Somebody on the crew just yelled at some point, I think dogs with baby heads are like so freaky. And the director was like, oh yeah, also cat. <laughs> Lisa eventually finds Freddy slash Jesse and she, well, she gives him a big old kiss and tells him that she loves him, which is objectively disgusting. Whatever erection this gave Jesse causes Freddy to sort of melt and catch on fire. And after he's done burning, Jesse crawls out of the ashes of Freddy, so. We did it, team! And now it's the next day and Jesse's riding another bus, but it's obviously a dream. He owns a car, right? Why would he even ride the bus? But then, yeah, Freddy's arm just explodes out of a girl's tits and they're like, back in the infamous Ohio desert the state is so well known for. So scary. I wonder if I have dream powers. I doubt it. Told you. <laughs> The third movie opens with an Edgar Allan Poe quote because apparently he hated sleeping almost as much as ravens. Then we get a little card with a subtitle, Dream Warriors. Oh, shit. Looks like we're taking the fight to Freddy for once, baby. What weapons are we gonna use? Magic swords? Dream machine guns? A tank made out of Leonardo DiCaprio? Or flour? And glue. So paper mache? It's cool too, I guess. I also never really thought about how cummy paper mache looked until this moment. Speaking of wet dreams, this thick jizz juice is being spread by a girl who would be asleep if not for spoonfuls of raw coffee grounds and Diet Coke. Then her mom, who probably won't have to put out the red light tonight, busts in and tells her to go to sleep. And a strange man from downstairs yells about wanting to plow her. And this is now the second nightmare movie featuring a single mom hooking up with dudes in the middle of the night. The plowing hour comes whether we want it to or not. This movie also features the return of Wes Craven's involvement. So maybe that's just a thing he writes into all his movies. Man loves himself a good milf. It turns out that the daughter, named Kristen, is using that semen to craft a diorama version of the Elm Street house. Seems like a bad idea. Also, before we get too much further, I think it's fair to warn everybody that this third movie deals with a ton of teen suicides. So. Be warned. Anyway, Kristen falls asleep and wakes up in front of a full-size, presumably cum-free Elm house. <laughs> I need to do a cum count. <laughs> you know what we need is a cum count. It's like Count Chocula, but you don't want to eat it. Anyway, Kristen falls asleep and wakes up in front of a full-size, presumably cum-free Elm house, but in some alternate nightmare universe, complete with creepy singing children and a wee girl on a tricycle. Kristen follows the little girl into the house and eventually down into the basement, but unfortunately, the movie doesn't have the balls to show us this presumably sick-ass scene wherein the little girl careens down the stairs on her trike because she's still got it downstairs. Of course, the furnace comes on and there are skulls in there and the girl says, Freddy is home. So Kristen starts running, but the floor becomes goo again. Oh. And then Freddy shows up and there's a bunch of, sorry, this is the 
kind of the start of the thing, hanging children. But then she finally wakes up and she's pretty wet, but nothing like the last kid. I think scientists refer to this as a moist dream. Then Kristen lugs her moist ass into the bathroom and ah, shoot, Freddy's in the mirror. It causes her to slit her own wrist, which Damn it. Kristen is then committed to a psych ward and we hear on a radio that there's been a whole rash of teen suicides. And then we see with our eyes, the god of sleep and dreams himself. Morpheus. Lawrence Fishburne just loves sleepy time dream movies, apparently. <laughs> the phlegm, Dave. It's like the cum of the throat. <laughs> I'm so excited for my daughters to grow up and watch my, my work. Watch my work. <laughs> anyway, we then see therapist Neil. Uh, fun fact, all movie therapists are named Neil, and he performs a poor man's Sorkin walk and talk. He eventually arrives at Kristen. It was not doing so great, but it's all good because, oh, hey, it's Nancy from the first movie. She's back, and the costume designer and makeup artists are doing everything they can to make her look like she's not 13 years old. Turns out Nancy has become a hotshot grad student specializing in nightmares, naturally, and she heads around the ward meeting the other crazy kids. First, she heads into a room with a helpfully captioned poster. The United States space program has been doing just that. In there is a kid named Philip who makes freaky ass dolls and who everybody, including the staff, call the walk because he sleepwalks, you see. Uh. Feels kind of shitty to give a kid a nickname based around a symptom stemming from his psychosis, but I guess it's good that he's not named the best or the guy who keeps eating whole sticks of butter in one bite. But to be fair, Philip immediately mocks his roommate Kincaid for always being thrown into solitary confinement after outbursts, so I guess everybody in here sucks. Then Neil heads home to read some 80s text-only porn. He also looks up a drug called Hypnosil that he saw Nancy take earlier. Turns out it's an experimental drug to help you not dream. Elsewhere, Kristen is hanging out in bed and witnesses the aftermath of a tricycle hit and run. Oops. Turns out she's asleep and she's back in the Elm House and considering eating a pretty yucky pig meal. She takes too long to decide and instead gets eaten herself by a yucky Freddy worm. While this is going on, Nancy hears Kristen screaming from inside the Jismache Elm House and then she falls through her chair into Kristen's dream, as one does. Nancy stabs the Freddy worm in the eyeball and they both wake up. Turns out Kristen has always been able to do this and when she was little, she used to pull her dad into dreams. But then her parents got divorced like everybody's parents in these movies and she forgot about this insanely incredible power because I don't know capitalism or Facebook or communism or something the modern world damn it anyway here's the rest of the kids there's Joey who doesn't talk because he's too busy lusting over the nurses Taryn who is a few years too early for reality bites will who is probably a great guy but is also probably pretty terrible at hurdles and Jennifer who wants to be an actress and apparently doesn't think a nightmare on Elm Street 3 dream warriors is good enough for her all these kids keep having the same dream about a dude with knife hands trying to kill them but the doctors say nah you're all just feeling guilty because y'all try to kill yourselves and also because you're all horny because I mean look at you guys yummy yummy am I right and then Kincaid says what I say whenever my penis gets wrapped around my neck in the middle of the night great mass my dick is killing me after that Neil and Nancy head on what appears to be a date I mean it's either that or a preliminary meeting to feel out whether Nancy's interested in being adopted by the much older Neil Philip's creepy dolls transform into creepy Freddy with the creepy power of creepy stop motion Freddy then becomes true motion and sort of slices open Philip's wrists and feet and pulls him around using his tendons, which the movie never explicitly says hurt, but it's definitely Aww. implied. Weirdly, to everybody else, it just looks like Philip is sleepwalking in the weirdest possible way. But I thought all of Freddy's woundings manifested in the real world. Why not these wounds? I don't know. But then Freddy tugs Philip out of a window, which... <laughs> That, that, that one sticks. The next day in group, the doctors claim Philip's death was a suicide, and Kincaid agrees because he says that Philip was weak. And the other kids say, no, it was because of his nightmare, and the doctor says, no, it wasn't. And then Kincaid gets mad and, and says the doctors are blowing smoke up his ass because Kincaid does not know what he believes. Oh. He just likes to be angry. Pretty cool to see a metaphor for the modern internet in this random pre-internet horror movie. Mark! By the way, there's a lot of smoking in the psych ward, including kids. Like, how old are these kids anyway? Apparently just old enough for this totally rad smoking nurse man. Elsewhere, Freddy attacks Zaza on the TV and takes over the TV to kill Jennifer. Then we cut to just Jennifer's funeral because I guess Philip wasn't popular enough to have oh. one. And Neil sees a creepy white nun and chases her down. She tells him, okay, 
So the only way to save these kids is to put an unquiet spirit to rest because just like an Arby's, it is an abomination to God. Then she disappears. Hey Dave, do you remember my nickname in high school? Yeah, dude, everybody called you Malaysian Dream Doll. Anyway, Nancy explains that Freddy wants revenge on these kids' parents for burning him alive. They are the last of the Elm Street kids, even though I'm gonna guess that's not all he wants, given that there are like six more movies in this franchise. But anyway, Nancy also claims that each kid has a secret special dream power, like Kristen's ability to pull people in. So to figure out what those powers are, Nancy suggests they group hypnotize everybody to sleep. Initially, they think nothing's happening, but then Neil's balls start going crazy. Apparently, they're all in the same dream, so they show each other their powers. The kid in the wheelchair can now walk and do magic as the Wizard Master, a title invented by somebody clearly smashing a couple of shitty nerd words together and calling it a day, and Kristen could apparently also backflip? I thought she already had a power. Why does she get to double dip? I don't know. Kincaid is fairly strong, and Taryn grows a mohawk and has a couple butterfly knives. I guess that's a power. And Joey's power is apparently getting that puss. Because this is the third movie in a long-running horror franchise, and that's when you start cranking up the gratuitous nudity. They did it in Saw, they did it in Final Destination, and they did it in Santa Claus. I mean, they may have cut the Mrs. Claus and Mr. Claus intimacy scenes for time, but I know they were there! Anyway, this sexy nurse turns into a less sexy Freddy who tongue-ties Joey to the bed, because he can't talk, get it? Then the bed disappears and Joey hangs over a pit to hell, and you know, seems like they maybe should have kept somebody away wait. Literally the whole group is passed out, meaning that nobody can shake Joey's Woody until he wakes up. And because of the worst planners of all time, Joey ends up in a coma and Nancy and Neil get fired, which seems completely fair given the evidence. On his way out, Neil sees the white nun again, but on the top floors of the ward, so he busts back in and confronts her. She tells him that back in the good old days, a staff member once got stuck in the building with some inmates over holiday weekend because I guess they just make the patients promise not to escape or do anything bad while they're gone, and she was repeatedly raped and ultimately impregnated. Naturally, that baby became Freddy, and the only way to defeat him is to ignore science and destroy his bones because that's their money. In our world, bones equal dollars. Of course, they don't know where Freddy's bones are, so Nancy and Neil go to find Nancy's dad, who just so happens to be getting drunk in a bar. He says he'd prefer not to go dig up the bones of the child serial killer he once set on fire and murdered. Oh. Then the kids contact Neil, and it turns out that the doctors are going to sedate Kristen, which would presumably trap her in a dream with Freddy with no chance to escape. I mean, she can pull other people into her dreams with her and also do killer backflips, but they're worried that that won't be enough. And they say, we've been going crazy, which seems like a poor choice of words given where they're located but whatever. So Nancy rushes back to the ward while Neil gets real physical with Nancy's daddy and forces him to to drive? Dude could barely stand five minutes ago. Then again, I'm pretty sure most pickup trucks don't start unless the driver is at least a little buzzed. Anyway, turns out that Freddy's dead boners are buried in an auto salvage yard, which is convenient in the event that the dad crashes because he's driving drunk. Back at the ward, Nancy tells the kids, if you die in the dream, you die for real. Again, just like Frankie Muniz. I'm sweet. And Kincaid says a line that I'm pretty sure the screenwriters thought was extremely cool when they wrote it, but... Let's go kick the mother they ask all over Dreamland. Nancy hypnotizes everybody and they immediately appear in Kristen's cell, somehow, and are just as immediately attacked by Freddy's feathers? And suddenly we cut back to the first scene with the hot mommy, except oops, this time Freddy cuts her head off. No biggie though, she keeps talking, twas a flesh wound. And anyway, Kristen escapes with another dope backflip and dive because dream powers. In a separate dreamscape, Taryn attempts the age old lure the undead spirit of a child serial killer with a blade glove towards your leather clad breast and then stab him with a couple of tiny ass butterfly knives and or your massive mohawk trick. That it doesn't work. Then the wizard master gets attacked by a wheelchair of death before fully transforming into a master wizard and still getting killed. At least if he's about to be eternally judged, he went out on a high note because when Freddy tells him to get in the evil wheelchair, Will very politely says, Oh, thanks. Sweet kid. Shitty wizard master. Bad at hurdles. Back in the Elm Street house, Kincaid, Nancy, and Kristen reunite and enter an evil door that's appeared in the middle of the room. Does it? Seem like a great idea, but maybe that's why they keep rejecting my application to be a dream warrior. Oh. Speaking of, what is Nancy's dream power exactly? <laughs> The door leads to a boiler room with Joey strapped down again. Man, that kid just loves being tied up. Still not sure what his strength is, but we sure know his weakness. <laughs> Freddy and Kristen ninja fight a bit, and then Freddy reveals his chest is covered in children's souls. So, 
Do with that what you will. Then, suddenly, randomly, they're no longer in the boiler room, but in a hallway of the mirrors. Freddy attacks them from the mirrors, and all seems lost. Meanwhile, in the real world, Neil and Nancy's dad get attacked by Freddy's bones. They immediately kill Nancy's dad and huck Neil in a shallow grave before celebrating and collapsing into a pile oh. again. Maybe he was just so surprised at how much food there was. You know, because underground there's half as much food as this. All they want's another chance at life. They've never seen so much food as this. But anyway, back with the mirrors. Joey finally finds his voice and screams, and, and that breaks all the mirrors, which buys them some time. And then Nancy's dad sort of floats in and is like, hey, I died, but I wanted to briefly say, sorry, I'm such a shitty dad, but oops, just kidding. It's actually Freddy. And he kills Nancy, except, oh, not fully, so she stabs Freddy with his own glove and like, I don't know what to believe anymore. Who is who? Who am I? Obviously, Freddy's not fully dead, but it's all good because thanks to Freddy's bones unwillingness to double tap Neil, GQ Sexiest Therapist, 1987, he crawls out of the grave, pushes the bones into the grave, and then dumps some holy water and a crucifix on the bone. That kills Freddy, I guess. <laughs> Nancy still appears fully dead, however, and also I assume Beastmaster on Wheels and Cyberpunk 1987 both remain dead, too. So that's a uh. Not sure how Neil's gonna explain all this to the cops, but uh, good luck. Also, briefly, we learned that nun was Amanda Krueger, Freddy's mom, and also she's dead. Also, also, Neil isn't in jail yet by the end of the movie, but a little light comes on in the paper mache elm house, so it almost seems like Freddy maybe isn't dead either, because he's never dead. Not until he stops putting butts in seats, baby! <laughs> What the hell was that? Uh, the closest thing we could get to drowning in a waterbed. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, sometimes you just work with what you got, you know? Yeah, I hear you, man. Oh, sh Kristen, not again. Anyway, Elm Street 4 sees Elm Street's 3's Edgar Allan Poe quote and raises it a full on Bible quote. This one is from the fourth chapter of Job, which many say is the a nightmare on Elm Street of the Bible. <gasps> Speaking of things that are cool, about the subtitle of this movie, The Dream Master? That sounds cool, but then you realize you only need like three years of eight hours a night's sleep to get your 10,000 hours and become a certified master, so. Anyway, whatever, way off the rails already. Here are some close-ups of somebody chalking. It's revealed, this is a literal girl. Hello. Scratching away at a chalk sketch of the Elm House, but right in front of the actual Elm House. Also revealed is the composer's recent discovery of the mod wheel on his synthesizer. A different, older girl walks up to the original, younger girl, and asks where Freddy is, and the kid is like, He's not home. But then she moves her hand to reveal, <gasps> A shitty chalk drawing of Freddy? <laughs> Why is that scary if she literally just asked about Freddy? Kids are stupid. Now it's suddenly raining. <laughs> So this stupid girl runs inside the stupid Elm Street house and a tricycle slams down the stairs, just like I assume it did in the third movie, but without concussing the little girl, unfortunately. And the girl wanders around and whispers the name, Kristen. Become Kristen. Revealing that she's actually a recast version of Patricia Arquette's character from the last movie. <laughs> Rude. Also, here's a baby riding a chandelier. <laughs> then the window explodes her into another boiler room. But this one has chains. I don't think I've ever been inside a boiler room, notwithstanding. Though, nor a nightmare where a small, mean burn victim tries to stab me either, to be fair. And Kristen uses her patented dream power to pull in Kincaid, who isn't thrilled about it. Aw, oh, And Joey, who's kind of ripped now. Looks like he found his voice and the free weights. Kristen is worried Freddy's alive again, somehow. But counterpoint, Freddy is dead. Kristen is then bit by Kincaid's dog. <laughs> She wraps up her bleeding, festering, rabies-infused wound and goes to pick up her boyfriend, Ricky, who inexplicably won't use the front door, and his sister, Alice, who is inexplicably called out for her outfit by their dad. You going out dressed like that? The way he says it implies that he thinks she's dressed like a hooker, but considering she's actually dressed like a Mormon lumberjack, maybe he's just disappointed with her fashion choices. So they drive to high school and see this tasty number across the parking lot. You know, you are one major league hunk. 
They also meet up with their other friends, Debbie, who works out a lot, and Sheila, who studies a lot, because this movie really wants to make sure that I know this 17-year-old girl has basically three times as many friends as I'll probably have in my entire life. Oh. Debbie insults a boy with a confounding small penis burn combined with a jerk-off motion that is truly inscrutable. I bet you're the only male in this school suffering from penis envy. <laughs> I owe you one. Why would he be the only male in school suffering from penis envy? Even if he has a small penis, the existence of penis envy presupposes the existence of at least one large penis at this school that this guy has compared his own penis to. But unless every single male in school has an identically shaped penis, then surely other dudes will envy other dudes' penises. You know what I'm talking about, right, Dave? Did this discussion help you with that joke? That don't mean dick. We later learn Ricky loves Japan and karate because who doesn't? And that the dad is having a tough time at work because you know. Them contracts. We also learn that Ken Cade is like super sporty now. He's playing darts while wearing a baseball glove and sitting on his bed like a young Tom Brady. All the athletic exertion causes him to fall asleep and wake up in the trunk of a car in the auto salvage yard from the last movie. Gonna pound your ass! Ken Cade's dog named Jason. Interesting. Is a bad boy who pisses literal fire and opens a portal to hell with his piss. In there are Freddy's bones and skin, and they and they reassemble, meaning that yep. Yeah. Kincaid thinks quickly and smashes Freddy with a car and is very pleased with himself. Yeah. But then Freddy stabs him, which Kincaid is less pleased about. From there, we cut to Kristen drinking soda like Trump drinks water, and then to Joey, who is evidently sleeping on a waterbed with a naked woman inside that you just know Trump has like three or four of. If he doesn't have a naked lady waterbed, then what is even the point of wealth? Why work at all? What is this, communist rush? I want naked women in my beds! But of course, for the second time in as many movies, Joey's horny dream becomes a horny nightmare, and a naked woman turns into a fully clothed Freddy. <laughs> If I were Joey, I wouldn't trust any naked women in my bed or or nurses. If they're naked, say no. That's my motto. But I'm not Joey, and he never learned that lesson. So Freddy kills him and stuffs him into the water bed, which is not a bed that I would like as much, but I could I'm sure there are people that would love Joey in a water bed. <laughs> Elsewhere, Alice reveals her mom is dead and her dad is an alcoholic because everybody's parents in these movies are dead, divorced, alcoholic, and or cops because those are the worst things you can be. Those are the top four. It's on a list. She also reveals that she is shitty at kicking despite Ricky's best attempts to become her sensei. Sorry. The next day, Kristen takes a smoke break on school grounds because the 80s were wild and Alice walks up and Kristen says, We have matching luggage again. And Alice is like, what? And Kristen is like, uh, the bags under your eyes. Luggage. Because these movies are written by aspiring poets. Speaking of, then Alice asks Kristen if she's ever heard of the Dream Master. And like, obviously not. Might as well be asking if she's ever heard of the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise. Sounds like a game show host to me. But apparently the Dream Master isn't so much a person who has conquered death with powers that some might deem unnatural. But actually a, a literal rhyme that just explains uh the best way to sleep without nightmares is to think about something fun before you fall asleep anyway in class later ricky mentions offhand in the background that anyway kafka and, and gareth have never been irreconcilable to me because again this movie is written by german genius literary masters english is my lieblings 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 but before kristen can fully wrap her mind around ricky's staggering intellect. She notices that Kincaid and Joey's desks are empty, which obviously immediately means that they are super dead. She starts to get upset, but then Ricky calms her down by just knocking her the f out. Wait, calm down. No! Kristen wakes up in a hospital bed looking up at a nurse that is certainly a man. And yeah, it's Freddy. And he does some scary things. And then she wakes up and now it's presumably a biologically female nurse. Thank God. Then they go to a diner called the Crave Inn. As in Wes Craven. <laughs> Which I assume means 
that one of the producers is named Soda Fountain? Man, this movie has layers. Kristen goes in and collects Alice, Ricky, and inexplicably the hot boy Dan from earlier because I guess he and Ricky are, are friends now? I don't get it. Anyway, they go to the Elm Street house and they don't do anything there, but it does kill five to 10 minutes of runtime which is how Kristen goes home and apparently her mom has managed to sew her head back onto her body between movies, which is very impressive. And she uses her new lease on life to drug her daughter with sleeping pills. Even though Kristen is presumably weeks removed from an extended stay in a psych ward for attempted suicide as a result of fears of sleep, and nightmares. I'm sure she'll take kindly to being drugged unconscious by her primary caretaker. That probably won't cause her to relapse in any way. On that subject, when did Kristen and Kincaid and Joey get out of the hospital anyway? I mean, last we saw a therapist and like four kids had all died within the span of a week. Sure, they defeated Freddy and presumably sleep better now, but it must have been pretty challenging to convince the board that they weren't suffering major psychological trauma, you know, from all the dead children in their lives. We went over this in therapy! Well, whatever they're here now getting drugged by their parents i guess it all worked out Kristen then offers her mom a whiz bang line that's something like mom if you're keeping score this is a banquet and i'm the main course which is quite the mixture of metaphors unless she's referring to competitive eating in which case great line very good. Then Kristen tries to picture herself in a happy place and passes out. Turns out her happy place is also the happy place of most teen boys, which is to say a beach where Kristen is in a bikini. But it's spoiled, unfortunately, by the presence of a little girl making a sand castle. Hi. Oh, and Freddy curb stomps her into quicksand, which is also not fun. <laughs> Oh. Kristen ends up in the Elm Street house again, but now she can climb on walls for some reason. Before eventually ending up in another freaking boiler room. She accidentally conjures a wet Alice, which like, please teach me that trick. And then Freddy throws Kristen into the fire to death. No! But before she dies, Kristen imparts her dream powers onto Alice. <laughs> Because dreams! Alice wakes up and runs to Kristen's house, but she's full on on fire. Oh, and it turns out that Kristen was born in 1969. Yes. The next day, Debbie complains that she's dead on my feet. Which is quite the thing to say following the recent literal deaths of three of her friends. That's only slightly better than walking up to a New York firefighter on September 12th being like, man, I feel like the Twin Towers just fell on me or something. I'm just so sore. I like to make sure that all of my jokes are for everyone. <laughs> then Alice almost smokes, even though... I don't smoke. Apparently Kristen's dream powers were tied to her nicotine habit, which is quite unfortunate. Then Alice takes a physics test, except... Oops! Freddy takes over Sheila's test and attacks her and then makes out with her until she becomes a rag doll. <laughs> Then in real life, Sheila dies from an asthma attack. And then in real, real life, the actress who played Sheila then apparently had to come back into the studio after filming to redub all her lines to sound more black. You don't sound like a black girl, and this is not how a black girl is. And I was like, excuse me? Because the true villain of this movie is not Freddy. Also, Sheila built this contraption thing that apparently uses ultra high sound waves to scare off bugs. You know, because nothing scares bugs like a sound wave. That's ultra high. Anyway, Alice decides, okay, so Freddy was apparently only attacking the children of the parents who set his ass on fire way back when, and that's presumably where it would have ended, except Kristen pulled Alice into her dream, and that opened Alice up to Freddy's fingers. Daddy, would you like some sausage? And now he's using Alice to pull in other people like Sheila. So now I guess it's Alice's fault if anybody dies. She then goes to a class that's literally talking about dreams and dream power. The teacher mentions a theory that may or may not be ascribed to Aristotle, Aristotle in this world about how there are two gates one can enter in the dream world. A positive gate where you presumably dream about unicorns with rocket launchers and naked women in your waterbed. Where unicorns and fully clothed women try to murder you in and out of water beds. He also makes mention of a dream master who guards the positive gate and can protect a sleeping host. And despite this being the single most applicable lesson Alice has ever gotten in her entire life, she falls the hell asleep in like two seconds. Elsewhere, Ricky falls asleep whilst shitting and wakes up to cheerleaders watching him sh It's unclear if this, is, if this is in the positive or the negative gate. Seems pretty subjective, I mean. Nice. Uh, then the toilet stall becomes an elevator, which doesn't seem very fun. And then he spit out of it into a dojo where he spars with an invisible Freddy one-on-one. -on -one, and it has all the thrilling tension of a yellow belt fighting depression. <laughs> hey! Hey! <laughs> As one might expect, Ricky gets fingered 
to death. Alice, still in the classroom, wakes up, screams, and explodes the whole damn room. This is never mentioned again. At Ricky's funeral, Alice daydreams him being alive, but honestly, I think we're all better off with him dead. Hello, baby. Alice heads home and starts swinging Ricky's nunchucks around like a real pro, which seems to suggest she's also acquired his power. His power of nunchucks. Oh, a fellow chucker, eh? Alice and Dan decide to meet up and drive to Debbie's house, where they'll come up with a rock-solid plan to defeat Freddy. But, of course, Alice falls asleep before they can even begin to make that happen. And she merely dreams that she's sneaking out. She ends up in a movie theater that's about as packed as most theaters in 2020 were, and she gets sucked into a movie, which is basically the Crave Inn, but post-apocalyptic and black and white. She's greeted by a mean old lady version of herself, and then Freddy obviously shows up <coughs> and says some one-liners. If food don't kill you, the service will. And shows her a pizza where the meatballs are dead people. Allison wakes up and meets Dan and decides that she needs to drive his car for some reason, and they somehow end up back at the Crave Inn and do the same scene again. They do this scene four, four times. times, so clearly she's still asleep. While that's happening, Freddy murders Debbie while she works out by snapping her arms and turning into a cockroach, which is just so Kafka-esque. But doesn't that mean that Debbie is asleep? And also Dan? For that matter? Weren't they all agreeing to meet up around this time? And yet all three of them fell asleep independently of each other? Even though that was the one thing they all knew that they should not do? Freaking morons. What the hell was that? Anyway, Alice eventually crashes into Freddy. He was actually just a tree in real life, I guess? So did she and Dan end up meeting and then both falling asleep in the car until they hit a tree? How the hell did that happen? I don't know. But Dan's injuries are bad enough that he's rushed to the hospital and Alice refuses to let the doctors give him sedatives in the ambulance, but she knows that she won't be able to do anything about it once he's in the operating room. Especially considering that his doctor is Freddy and not Dr. Seuss. Though to be fair, Dr. Seuss' legacy has been getting some critical reevaluation recently, so it's all, it's a little bit complicated. Alice races home, pounds a bunch of sleeping pills, and laces up a bunch of leather, and in a Grease-esque transformation, goes from a mousy girl to a badass, whole-ass woman with a potty mouth. Fucking A. Alice uh, then passes out and goes and grabs Dan in their sleep and they wander through some surreal tunnels like a low budget LSD version of the Inception hotel fight scene. And eventually Dan is pulled out of surgery and wakes up for real. <laughs> So now it's just Alice and Freddy in the dream world and she comes at him with all sorts of cartwheels and, and flips and shit, but it doesn't have much of an effect. Freddy claims that though she has her friend's powers of nunchucks and smoking, Freddy has their damn souls, which is apparently the rock to her scissors. <laughs> oh, it should be. Which is apparently the scissors to her paper, because he has knife gloves. You get it. Bitch. They keep fighting, and Freddy mentions that he's been guarding his gate, which I guess is the negative gate, and evidently this suggests that Freddy and Alice are like polar opposites of each other in, in Dreamland or some shit, because she's the dream master, and he's the dream dick. <laughs> and speaking of, Alice was the little girl Kristen kept seeing in her dreams at the house on the beach and shit. What's your name? Alice. I have a friend named Alice. <laughs> That was a younger version of Alice, but apparently didn't have much power other than occasionally mentioning, hey, yeah, Freddy's around. I don't know what you do with that, but aside from Kristen, Alice uh, never guarded anybody else in any movie for any reason. So take that knowledge and treasure it. But anyway, Dream Master Alice then takes the bug sound wave thing from Sheila and plugs it into an electrical wire and electrocutes Freddy. <laughs> which seems like something Aristotle may not have anticipated. Of course, this still doesn't kill Freddy, but then Alice remembers the Dream Master rhyme, which is apparently, now I lay me down to sleep, the master of dreams my soul I'll keep. In the reflection of my mind's eye, evil will see itself. And it's so that is what Alice's now dead mom used to say to her when she fell asleep? That is weird as shit. What is a five-year-old supposed to do with that exactly? I don't know, but Alice interprets that now to mean that Freddy will die if he sees himself in a mirror. So she shows him a mirror. We then zoom through his body, I guess, and see a bunch of seemingly nude children in there, which like, do I need a lawyer? For watching this? Then a bunch of kids start busting out of Freddy. 
And yet there are some very clear boobies there. And I, I will absolutely be seeking representation after this and suing Wes Craven for entrapment. <sighs> Eventually Freddy dies and the souls go giggling off to heaven, I guess. <laughs> And then Alice walks into, I guess, the positive gate. And now Alice and Dan are dating, I guess. But oops, Freddy's reflection is in the water fountain. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that I bet he's not fully dead. Even if he's been fully emptied of nude children. Okay, I'm going to, I need a lawyer. Well, shit. Okay, so back in the 80s, I tried to pull an American horror story and launched a weird-ass anthology horror series, nightmare spinoff thing called Freddy's Nightmares. I hosted every episode, and a few episodes revolve around me doing my haunting thing, but I'll admit, really, only the pilot episode really provides any additional backstory to the actual films. It's basically just a prequel look at my trial and stuff from back in the day, bitch. You're gonna force me to watch that too, aren't you? Oh yeah, and it's gonna be grainy as hell. No! No, no, no. So whatever, we open with a news anchor giving news, and then, oh no, now he's facing out of existence, only to appear again in front of a courthouse. He's confused, he just sort of rolls with it and continues reporting because he's a damn professional. Unlike the rest of the mainstream media! Where the hell are we? Turns out he's reporting on the trial of serial killer Freddy Krueger. Objection, your honor. Excuse me. Alleged unholy aberration. But before he can be locked away, the defense presents new evidence that suggests Freddy wasn't read his Miranda rights. So the whole case is thrown out as a mistrial, except here's the deal. Freddy was caught preying on two girls in the arresting cop's actual home. Not reading Miranda rights is a break from procedure, sure, but all it means is that anything Freddy says or cackles or whatever can't be used against him as evidence. The evidence that he was presumably in somebody else's house preying on their daughters and wearing a glove made of steak knives would still be admissible as well as literally any other evidence they have. But whatever, doesn't matter because... <gasps> that is your fault! You screwed up and now he's free! The prosecuting lawyer gathers up the parents and says, all right, well, why don't we just murder Freddy ourselves? And they're all like, cool, that makes sense, because, man, parents used to be so cool. <laughs> Freddy, for his part, goes back to his abandoned warehouse and walks around with Freddy Vision engaged, which is like normal vision, but redder, and with way more wailing electric guitar solos. <laughs> Meanwhile, the arresting cop named Tim is told by one of his now crazy daughters that he can't just kill Freddy because that'll make it worse. And conversely, his cop buddy tells him he really should consider going out and murdering Freddy himself. But Tim says no. I respect the law almost as much as I hate Hick Towns. Which, okay, asshole, my whole dad's side of the family comes from Hick Towns and. You know, they're fine. The parent mob arrives at Freddy's warehouse, but he's not there. They do find tons of new evidence, like mementos from dead children, that would easily be more than enough for another trial, but whatever. It's not like the lawyer is a cop. How would he know? Freddy is skulking around Tim's house and murders the cop they have guarding it, which again is a pretty serious crime that could probably land you in jail, but mostly the guy's death is just super annoying to Tim. This night never ends, says the man whose family is being stalked by a serial killer. But Freddy gets scared away by the mob and Tim is like, What the hell is going on here? But the citizens go immediately back to the warehouse where Freddy is and hold him at gunpoint while Tim holds the mob at gunpoint. Freddy says he is forever, which really seems like a thing he couldn't possibly know. He's not freaking Obi-Wan Kenobi, but whatever. Tim has a dramatic change of heart for no reason and delivers this nonsensical powerhouse line. Law is the law, but tonight the law is on vacation. I wonder if the showrunner was also on vacation. Then Tim just freaking soaks Freddy in gasoline and sets him on fire. Freddy doesn't fight back because again, if he's struck down, he'll be more powerful than Tim could ever imagine. Then Tim goes to bed and has a nightmare about being FedEx to Freddy Glove. And then the next day his daughters are weird and a letter from Freddy catches on fire. And the other cop informs Tim that the FBI is coming and Tim is like, oh no, but I murdered Freddy. And his buddy's like, it's all good, my man. I'll go bury it. Because apparently Tim and the 10 angry parents just left the smoking corpse lying there. Later, Tim and the cop friend go to see the body, but it's not there. It, and they also, they find another body at the warehouse. That's the lawyer or whatever. And also inexplicably, the town dentist is at this crime scene because you never know when you might need an emergency root canal. Problem. Back at home, Tim's wife is extremely horny and she blows Tim right into another nightmare where he dreams about his daughters giving him 
the electric chair. Open wide. The next day, he yells at his daughter, presumably because she's such a mediocre vocalist. In my dreams and yours. And then at the station, Tim is starting to lose his freaking mind from all the nightmares, but the buddy cop is like, oh, by the way, I never said that the FBI was coming, but also I did hide the body, like I said. So I guess some of the things that were from that conversation were real, but not all of them, which is confusing. But regardless, Tim decides to go pick up the dentist from the from the dentist store for a super special meeting with the other parents so they can all settle on a specific story for what they're going to say when they're asked by the maybe FBI or maybe not. You know, just if anybody asked what they were doing when they were actually murdering Freddy. It's the only thing a man could do. But I guess Tim hurt his tooth earlier, so he and the dentist decide to cap it for him real quick before deciding how best to lie to the police and or maybe not uh, possibly the FBI. And I think going to the dentist was way better in the 80s. Because not only do they immediately gas him, they also give him headphones so he can listen to his jams. And best of all, the gas causes him to see the nurse in her skimpy underwear, so everything is going great until- Ow, sh Freddy murders him. All right, I'm, I'm gonna leave the TV now. You are making this way harder than it needs to be. Look, man, I'm just trying stuff. There are a lot of movies. I get it, but can I be normal again so I can just explain this stupid one? You are no fun at all, bitch. This boy feels the need for speed. Huh? So I've heard. All right, back to the main event. So the fifth movie is called The Dream Child, which is actually how I've been referred to by all former parents and employers. We open on some people having some dream sex to presumably create the aforementioned dream child, but the shots are so up close and low lit, I I'm just gonna have to take their word for it that they're putting the correct parts in the correct holes. The lights eventually come on to reveal Alice, who is now blonde because maybe she also absorbed Kristen's hair color alongside her smoking habit. And apparently Alice was the one being taken to Pleasure Town. She heads into the bathroom to wash off that teenage filth when, oops, poop starts coming out of the drain and fills up the shower and then spits her out into a dungeon or some shit with a very confusing special effects shot. With her are several weirdos in nasty pajamas, and now she's a nun, which is to say Amanda Kruger, presumably, because she's essentially reliving Amanda Kruger's assault, as described in the third movie. <laughs> Yay. Anyway, that was just the cold open. So now they're at their high school graduation, and I guess Dan was the valedictorian, and also he's just like so silly. So let's blow, whoa, whoa, this pop stand. Apparently Alice has made several new friends between movies, you know, since all of her old friends friends were brutally murdered. And speaking of, I would kill for a hot dog right now. That's not what a cover girl puts in her body. Dan inexplicably scares the ever-loving shit out of Alice. <gasps> hey, beautiful. <gasps> Jesus, don't do that. Despite her being in a huge crowd of people in the middle of the day and reminds her and the audience that he's purchased two tickets for the two of them to fly to Paris where they'll live for the entire summer because apparently Dan is a millionaire. He's also apparently so good at football, he hasn't even committed to a school yet despite actively graduating. But to be fair, this boy feels the Need for speed. Huh? Alice sees some creepy singing jump roping kids and decides to chase them, which is a terrible idea. And then she decides to chase a creepy white nun towards an insane asylum, which is an even worse idea. Is this supposed to be the same asylum as the third movie, or does this part of Ohio just have tons of psych wards with highly variable architecture? Well, inside, Alice sees a weird, massive baby basket, and then suddenly, uh, uh, she herself is on a gurney. <gasps> And then she sort of flips between being Amanda Kruger crapping out a baby and watching Amanda Kruger crapping out a baby. Why is this happening again? And it turns out the baby is Freddy, but also a creepy alien from hell, which seems to sort of negate the idea that Freddy's physical issues were born, you know, from being set on fire. Apparently the dude was li literally born burned. Talk about a hot vagina. <laughs> Holy sh Freddy the alien baby screams a bunch and destroys a church and crawls into a Freddy sweater on the ground and that's enough justification for him to be reborn, I guess. It's a boy! It must have been way easier to write horror films when nobody needed it to be a metaphor or a commentary on anything. It's just like, hey, so our villain died last movie because something's up to dreams and mirrors and shit, so how do we bring him back? Oh, just have him be born as a f***ed up squid rat and crawl into his Sweater. Oh, you've done it again, Jeff! That's movie magic! Uh, but no, they do try to explain it a bit when Amanda shows up again and explains that Freddy's birth was a curse and Freddy has brought her back to help bring him back, but now she's gonna take his life, which actually still doesn't make any damn sense. 
And regardless, if Alice could just find a mirror line around somewhere, she could just nip this right in the bud, but I guess she can't. So Amanda tells Alice that she needs to be released from her earthly prison, and Alice is like, How? And Amanda's like, look for me in the tower. And fun fact, Alice never does this, and apparently forgets this part of their conversation entirely. But I didn't! Anyway, now Alice is in the diner where she works, but she's four hours late because she was giving birth to the Antichrist, but her co-worker doesn't want to hear it! I thought she were John C! <laughs> it is amazing how casually Alice tries to explain to every random person in her life that she's being chased by a serial killer in her dreams and birthing Antichrist like that's ever going to work as an excuse. But believe me, I am always trying to skip work by telling my boss that I was stabbed in my dreams, but he doesn't want to hear it! I feel you, Alice. So everybody else is having a pool party at school like horny wet teens are wont to do and this total badass over here crushes a beer bottle with his bare hand. Oh. Alice calls Dan to tell him what happened and she thinks that Kruger is attacking her even when she's awake. And Dan drives to her but immediately falls asleep. For your calls. Because the kids in this town are freaking wussies. You can tell this is a pre-land party's world. Bimbo slut! Mom? Freddy attacks Dan in the car with all sorts of random sh** like evil seatbelts and, and Freddy pulling off his own arm and then making Dan sort of crash which causes Dan to then steal a motorcycle which is haunted naturally and turns Dan into a C-plus Mad Max villain. Obviously this all leads to Danny crashing into another truck and dying but like you don't need a nightmare stalker to do that. Falling asleep at the wheel is super dangerous. The cops say it was an accident and again Alice is like no it's Kruger's fault but I hate to say it Alice. The cops are right. Dan's a piece of shit, and he's lucky he didn't hurt anybody else besides the trucker dude whose head is bleeding like crazy. Furthermore, they found pieces of a champagne bottle in Dan's car and conclude that he'd been drinking, but Al says, Dan didn't drink. He was just bringing that champagne to me to celebrate our trip to Paris. Do you think you might've drank it then? Do you think Dan might've drank it then? You freaking idiot. Well, thank God she didn't drink anything because Dan did manage to get just a little liquid in her. You're just a little pregnant. Back at Alice's house, her now sober dad has bought carrots to help with Alice's pregnancy. Although back in college, I knew a couple of guys who had a contest to see who could eat the most carrots and they both ended up in the hospital. So I, I guess just like limit your intake. Elsewhere, Alice's hot friend Greta sits crying in a room full of dolls that will 100% be haunted at some point in this movie. Until then, Greta's being fussy at a dinner party and inexplicably passes out mid conversation is there something in the water in this town she is of course attacked by freddy who's a chef now and <laughs> feeds her nasty things and it's disgusting and she dies <laughs> i guess i was wrong about the dolls which is weird because i'm never wrong about these things alice and another friend named yvonne go to check on a third friend named mark who is mopily skateboarding around a warehouse in sadness yvonne leaves so mark and alice hang out but then who Mark turns into a comic drawing and gets sucked into a sketch of the Elm Street house, as one does. So Alice draws a shitty drawing of herself to chase after him and maybe the most brilliant bit of quick thinking ever filmed. She wanders around the house and finds Mark in a hole, so she pulls him out and then talks to a little kid named Jacob who's almost certainly her unborn child. Alice wakes up and realizes Freddy can get to her even when she's awake through the dreams of unborn Jacob who sleeps all the damn time like a millennial. Alice gets an ultrasound to check for or something, but starts pissing herself with static and gets sucked into the ultrasound to discover Freddy is feeding her baby the souls of her friends, which is probably way more dangerous than carrots. Mark, who now believes Alice, sort of suggests an abortion, but Alice says no, and I, I get it, but a lot of people are being murdered because of this baby, so I, I do wish she at least had a bit more urgency in her attempts to defeat Kruger. For example, have you thought about going to the damn tower to look for Amanda? Like she said in the first like three minutes of the movie? No. Instead, she and Mark do some research and learn that Amanda back in the day was believed to have hanged herself, but it could never be proved because they couldn't find the body. Now, I'm no coroner, but why would you assume that somebody you've never found hanged themselves instead of ran away? or drowned or something? Hung bodies tend to be found, and yes, I said hung that time, because I was gonna make a penis joke here, but I, I ran out of time and this video is Truly so long. Do you know how many damn words these videos are? This one is almost 25,000. Write your own penis jokes. Anyway, Mark reads a book of Christian mythology and decides, you know what they should do is find Amanda and release her soul. Man, if only somebody had mentioned something like this to Alice 
at an earlier point in the film. Alice finally decides to search the asylum, but like only in her dreams. So she goes to sleep while Mark reads comic books and almost certainly jerks it. Elsewhere, Yvonne goes to the pool and has many strange things happen, culminating in her getting stuck in a water tank with Freddy. Come to think of it, there's no boiler room in this movie, I don't think, so that's nice. Also nice is that Alice saves Yvonne. And then Mark, for his part, falls asleep and turns into a comic book again, kicking off one of the stupidest sequences I have ever seen in any movie. Freddy chases Mark around while skateboarding and then sort of shows him Greta as a haunted a haunted doll! A haunted doll! And that's all dumb, but then Mark becomes a comic book character. Scarface limp He shoots Freddy, you know, like superheroes do, shoot shit. But it doesn't work, and Freddy says, Told ya! Comic books was bad for ya! And then Mark becomes 2D and Freddy slices him up in the least terrifying kill scene ever. I've seen a dog eat a napkin. It's just not that scary. I'm sorry, but I wish you had asked me before you filmed the scene. So whatever, Mark's dead. No! And I bet he wished he pushed the abortion thing a bit harder, but now Yvonne believes Alice. So the two agree to go to the tower to look for Amanda because Alice noticed I was in the tower when he used you to distract me. Maybe he's hiding something in that tower. Yeah, he is! The damn thing you were talking about at the beginning of the movie, you freaking simple moron! Dream Master, my asshole. So Yvonne goes to the asylum in the real world, and Alice in the dream world. And I guess that means it is supposed to be the same asylum as the third movie, which means it got some significant structural renovations before being abandoned somehow all in the span of two years. And Freddy's there, but Alice impales him with that big baby basket and he gets attacked by inmates that are all just around still and they rip his arm off. <laughs> but then the arm turns into spiders, <laughs> which attack Alice and she's unable to do much about it because she is shockingly terrible at stomping on spiders. So now it's like an MC Escher painting from hell and they're running around here and running around there and Jacob is there and then Dan shows up, but it's not really Dan, it's Freddy. And Jacob says, oh, actually, Freddy's inside you. Because he knows you so well. So Alice like half forces Freddy out it, it, somehow. And <laughs> and I don't think I'm stepping too much out on a limb here to say that this movie is dumb as shit. It's, it's a dumb as shit movie for dumb as shit people. You dumb sh In the land of the real, Yvonne is brutally assaulted by some doves. <sighs> but she fights through the pain and finds Amanda's body, sort of, and frees her soul or some such stupid sh And now Amanda is also in the dream world. And yet after all that talk from me and the movie about how Amanda is the only one who can defeat Freddy, all she actually does is tell Jacob to help. So Jacob like pukes on Freddy or something. School's out, Cougar. <laughs> And then the three souls of the people that Freddy has murdered so far in this movie try to escape out his chest and they do it so hard that they pull out the baby version of Kruger. And then Jacob reverts back to a baby too. And then Amanda and Alice stuff their babies back into their bodies, I guess. And then Amanda takes Freddy somewhere. And then it's a picnic and Alice has the kid in real life, but also there are some creepy kids again. And the scariest of all is this guy damned rap hold up is he a man or a girl what in the world i cannot believe there's another whole movie in this series Ow! Got him. Ah! you're freaking working with freddy pays the bills man i hate this nightmare throws controller now i'm playing with power <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. Ooh, open up with a Nietzsche quote, huh? Looks like we're full pretension here, kids. Oh, a Freddy quote? I guess we're also full stupid. Can I please not watch this? No. Ah, damn. Well, according to the title, Freddy's dead, which has both technically been true the entire time and also is made extra super true at the end of every movie. So I'm curious to see what happens here. According to this graphic we're now 10 years in the future for no apparent reason and every single child in springfield ohio has died and the adults are going insane there is one surviving teen however and now we're on a turbulent airplane with presumably the teen in question who looks like johnny depp's cousin there's someone on the way something and he wants to change seats because he's scared of heights and the woman next to him helpfully suggests don't be a pussy then she gets sucked up and he gets sucked down and he wakes up in a bed in a house falling from the sky and sees the wicked witch outside but it's actually freddy i'll get you my pretty 
and your little soul too. Ah! <laughs> oh God, I don't have the energy for this. The house lands on Elm Street and he sees the Elm Street house and then he falls down a hill for a hot rod length of time. Then he sees a creepy ticket man <laughs> and gets hit by a bus <laughs> that Freddy is driving <laughs> which cuts a boy shaped hole in the fabric of reality which Freddy then closes and you know I think there are certain situations where imagination is a bad thing. So the kid's been knocked out by a rock <laughs> but wakes up with a newspaper clipping in his pocket about a missing Kruger woman. Great. He heads to a nearby town but is caught pulling a burrito out of his crotch by some cops and taken to a local youth shelter, presumably specializing in kids with extreme Mexican food fetishes. <laughs> Speaking of, meet Spencer. He likes playing video games, ignoring his dad, and creating consequence-free Chekhov's pipe bombs in this pre-Columbine world. Oh, and if you were wondering, he isn't a Toyota. If he had been, that would have made this movie much more interesting. Could also explain the pipe bomb. Also, in this shelter, is this punchy girl named Tracy who already told me when I asked you ain't getting none there's also Carlos who has a hearing aid and the three of them are intending to escape at some point good luck they're all being serviced by a hot young therapist named Maggie maybe and also this dude named Doc who has the creepiest counseling office of all time he believes in dream therapy and oh by the way here's a dream picture of dream demons who oh by the way search for the most evil human they can find and give them the power to make dreams reality just felt like something worth mentioning anyway so they're calling the kid from the beginning John Doe because apparently he has complete amnesia and late stage Holism. I don't know! One symptom of this is singing late into the night while everybody else just tries to get some damn sleep. What a case of that. Doesn't work though, because again, these kids were born in a softer era before doom scrolling. And a little girl shows up and John walks on air some and he finds a crazy version of himself that claims to be his memory and on and on and on, you know, dream sh as it turns out, Maggie has also been dreaming about that little girl, so that's odd. So odd, she decides to drive John back to Springfield, Ohio to see if they can find some answers. I don't entirely remember how she or he knows that's where he's from or why he decided to not go back to Springfield initially when he woke up with no memory right outside Springfield, but I also don't give a shit. So they grab a van and they almost crash, which reveals the three other jackass kids stowed away in the back seat. The therapist is so upset, she immediately drives to a creepy town fair and tells the three kids to take the van back to the shelter. As in, she gives the keys to the three kids who were just attempting to run away from the shelter, despite the fact that this means she herself and her amnesiac mental patient will be literally stranded at this creepy ass fair. But then again, this fella seems to be living his best life. Naturally, it doesn't matter because they end up just driving in circles because, you know, dream oh, shit. Shit. Also, their map is just much too large. They decide to spend the night in the Elm Street house, which was sneakily and coquettishly pretending to be a normal non-evil house. Yeah. That am. Carlos immediately falls asleep and into a dream and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna rip through these next few hauntings here because while I'm sure the writers and crew were having fun I wasn't Carlos ends up in an alley where his mom threatens to clean his ears with a big old q-tip except oops it's not her because nobody is themselves they're all actually Freddy and he shoves the thing in his ear and then he cuts off Carlos ear which kind of makes the whole cleaning thing pointless and then Carlos falls into another boiler room warehouse thing but without his hearing aid effectively rendering him deaf now what would you do to torture a deaf person sound off in the comments because Kruger sort of dances around behind Carlos which is mean Sure, but only if Carlos ever realizes what's happening, which he doesn't. Then Freddy turns Carlos' hearing aid into a crab or some sh which is not very nice, sure, but then Freddy just, he literally drops pins and then he scratches a chalkboard. Obviously, Carlos can hear those sounds and I guess they're annoying enough for his head to f***ing explode. <laughs> But it's weird to torture a deaf person with really loud sounds, right? Like, that's probably not their main fear. I'd assume they'd be afraid of getting hit by a car or hit with a million jump scares because they can't hear what's happening. Or sure, just drop, drop 
pins or some shit. Who cares? Imagination! Then Kruger goes for Spencer, who is apparently not just a joker, but also a smoker and a midnight toker. He's high on pot weed and watching a broken TV, which apparently has zombies and also Carlos in it. Spencer falls asleep and into a psychedelic dream. Who knows the difference between marijuana and psychoactive drugs anyway? Tomato to lysergic acid diethylamide. Then he gets sucked into the TV, which has only happened to me like twice on pot maybe and then freddy plays a video game with spencer in it which is somehow the stupidest shit ever super spencer great graphics to beat my high score oh no no no! sorry then spencer's video game abilities manifest in the real world <laughs> and that is the stupidest shit ever <laughs> And while this stupid sh** is going on, John and Maggie wander around, again on foot, on their stupid feet, because they gave away the van, and end up at a weird abandoned high school with some rambling weirdo teacher. And they completely ignore him, even though in real life, this would be one of the most disturbing moments of a person's life. Somehow it's revealed that Freddy Krueger managed to have unprotected sex, and the state took away the resultant child, which was probably a good idea. So they go to, I guess, Freddy's old house to try and get some more clues, but all they find is a crazy woman, which again is terrifying. Oh, you've come back, how nice. Do you remember me? But doesn't phase them one bit. They also find an objectively bad drawing signed by some terrible artist named Kay Kruger, which isn't much of a clue because it could mean anything from Kevin to Kyle. That's a pretty wide range of names, but Maggie says, I doubt it. Then they run to the Elm Street house because John randomly claims they need to save the other kids before Freddy gets to them, even though as far as they know, the kids have left town. And do either of them even know anything about Freddy attacking people in dreams at this point? I guess John's just connecting his bad dreams to all the dead children and assuming they're like connected and all the same, but that's quite a leap, Carlisle with a K. They arrive and see Spencer tripping balls on that good ganja, and uh, John convinces Tracy to lay him out so he can help Spencer in Spencer's dream. And then Tracy enters too because she can meditate or something. And in the dream, Spencer dies, I guess. Ah! So Freddy eats his soul, I guess. Ah! And then I guess Tracy does some flips and, and kicks Freddy in the penis, I guess. Oh, yeah. And then Tracy wakes up, but John is still asleep. And then we get a gratuitous gamer boy feet shot. Oh, yeah. And then the house shoots into space because nightmare. And then he he's back in his bed, which is on fire. Damn it. And he jumps out the window, which is of course a million miles up again. So he pulls a parachute, but oops, Freddy's in the parachute kind of. And it turns out that Freddy had a daughter, not a son. So he cuts John's parachute and then like pushes a bunch of spikes in the middle of the road because I guess he's now Wiley Coyote, but John survives. <laughs> Just kidding, and then his corpse disappears like a shitty video game and his soul gets sucked into Freddy. Then Freddy literally says, It's traveling time! Like that's some sort of catchphrase or pun, but it's not, right? Freddy's just become that annoying dad who tries to make everything a limp play on words because he never learned how to tell a real joke or his children that he loves them. Aren't you a dad? It's not the point, Freddy! Freddy enters his daughter because Ohio, am I right? But Maggie isn't aware of this development, so they head back to the shelter, and I suppose the deal was Freddy couldn't leave Springfield unless he was using his daughter as a vessel. That feels a bit complicated considering he's been granted power by immortal dream demons. Dreamins, if you will. Okay, that's totally a dad joke. Shut up, Fred! They get back to the shelter, but instead of going to jail forever for being a dumb turd who got three kids killed, Maggie is fine because nobody remembers the three dead children except Tracy and Doc. Who cares what they think? Ugh. Doc then employs the unorthodox counseling technique of throwing his arm around his hot young client and then hanging out with her alone at night while she gets very sweaty. Man, this guy is very dedicated to his clients. Oh, and it turns out that Maggie was adopted. And now suddenly she remembers that she caught mommy catching her serial killer daddy, who just so happened to be a fully skinned, unburned Freddy. The mom promised not to tell anybody about, you know, all the, all the serial killing, but Fred was dubious. Maggie also saw the basement where daddy Freddy was doing the nasty and apparently he used knife gloves and in real life, despite their impracticality. Oh, and if you'd like a new fetish, here you go. Don't say daddy never does anything for you. Oh, yeah. 
guess this means that Freddy wasn't born a slimy, evil baby creature like in the last movie, and or that was just a dream sequence thing, and I guess that makes sense, but these movies, man, it's like, what's real? What is not real? So whatever, Freddy wants to kill all the kids in the shelter almost as much as the people who let the kids in the shelter build their own pipe bombs, and Tracy has a nightmare about her shitty dad who apparently sexually abused her, which is quite the juxtaposition tonally with that video game sequence. You can't have both, guys. And so Tracy beats her dad to death with a kettle, but then it turns into Freddy, naturally, and he says, Come move this, bitch. And again, I'm starting to think the writers lack the ability to appropriately handle issues like paternal sexual abuse. Just a thought. Tracy burns herself awake and appears to be talking to Doc, but actually, it's Freddy mimicking her voice. You taught her a lot. Freddy then cartwheels towards Doc and is immediately beaten with a bat. And then Freddy mentions something about how he can't be killed because the dream people, the ones that gave me this job. Okay. Then Doc wakes up because he'd set an alarm and has apparently grabbed a piece of Freddy's shirt and brought it into the real world. Doc, Maggie, and Tracy decide to do the exact plan from the first movie and send Maggie in to grab Freddy, pull him into the real world, and then, you know, beat the shit out of him. The twist is Doc gives Maggie dumbass 3D glasses that can be anything she wants in the dream world. Get the hell out of here. You want to live? So she puts them on in the dream and they disappear and then the demon things in the picture come to life and she enters Freddy's brain, I guess? And, and now she's in a purple lightning room. Uh, but she turns off the purple lightning by throwing a bracelet at a box. And now she sees a young Kruger hammer a mouse or something while kids chant which is way too clever for fifth graders to really understand. And then suddenly Freddy's older and cutting himself and enjoying being beaten by his alcoholic dad. Again, not sure these are the writers for this script. Thank you, sir. <laughs> May I have another? And now we see Freddy getting firebombed and then some ghosts or whatever fly into him with maybe the worst CG I've ever seen in my life. And this scene is nothing at all like the TV show. I guess they could just hand wave discrepancies by saying this is a dream or that was a dream or everything's a dream. But it's a little weird to create an entire prequel episode of TV just to retcon it a couple years later. Though counterpoint, none of it matters. Supporting point, nothing matters anywhere. Whatever. In this version, Freddy also reveals he killed the mom and told Maggie not to say anything, but surprise, she did. And like, how the hell did she forget all this? She was like five years old. And why did they change her legal name from Katherine Kruger to Maggie Burroughs? Why not just change her last name? Why change both names? Whatever. She pulls Freddy out. <laughs> and they grab a bunch of weapons from the arsenal built by disturbed children in the basement. And Freddy tries to lure Maggie to him, but then he telegraphs that he's got the glove, so she smacks it off, and they kind of fight. Come to daddy. Ah! But Doc and Tracy can't get to them, so Maggie just bites Freddy's nose. And there's weirdly very little music in this scene, or at least it's very quiet. And also, I wish Freddy would just stop laughing. I'm so tired of the damn laughing. It's not scary. It's not funny. It's annoying. I'm annoyed. Stop laughing! <laughs> then Maggie gets some knives and ninja stars and throws them with the accuracy of a member of the League of Shadows. Not sure which counseling class taught her that, but I honestly think there, there should be more therapists who are also world-class ninjas. Then Maggie grabs the Freddy glove and, and fingers Freddy with it. Then they... Chekhov's pipe bomb him with an explosion so terrible looking I have to assume they totally forgot to add it in until the day before it hit theaters and just slap something together in Microsoft Paint. Also the ghosts fly out of Freddy and laugh because that's how you know if something's scary if it laughs. How else would I know if it's scary? Maggie then says Freddy's dead. And then we get a supercut of the series Kill Highlights, which really highlights how mediocre most of them were. But thankfully, it's over. Right? Not oh, crap. Uh, hey. Are you gonna make me watch more of these movies? Weirdo. <laughs> oh my god! So I actually thought Freddy had died after the sixth movie, but it... He wasn't fully dead! That was a total goof on my part. As it turns out, he just went to hell. 
obviously, but he used some remaining power to resurrect Jason from the Friday the 13th movies and also from hell so that Jason could go back to Springfield and kill things and make people scared enough that Freddy could return so that he too could kill things. Because Freddy can only come back if he's remembered and feared. And also maybe he needs assistance from the Dreamins of a Nightmare Scape or something, but we're always gonna forget that about that whole subplot. Next we see some titties. Then those titties swim and then they start running and then they're stabbed into a tree by Jason. And fun fact, this is actually the second time we've seen those ogres. These titties are from the same girl is Final Destination 2! Who had her titties out in that movie? They don't give her a lot of lines, but she's got something that they like. <laughs> then Jason's mom shows up and says, you know what your gift is, Jason? It's that you can't die. Jason's like, yeah, I know, mom. Very aware of my gift, thanks. And then his mom is like, you should go to Elm Street and kill kids. And Jason, I guess, agrees because he comes back to life. But twist, uh, get this, Jason's mom was actually Freddy! Make them remember what the tastes like! Man, I don't remember any of this in the Bible. The Council of Nicaea left out all the good parts. We then see the Elm Street house, and I guess Chip and Joanna Gaines got their hands on it because it's looking pretty okay. Inside are three teen girls named Lori, Kia, and Gib. And one of them flicks a cigarette in Jason's face, but she didn't, she didn't know he was there. Then some surprise boys show up, and the main boy named Trey takes Gib? upstairs for some loveless sex, while the other girls and the guy named Blake hang out downstairs to quietly discuss key background exposition, like how the blonde girl's mom is dead and she used to be in love with a guy named Will that she hasn't seen in a while, and tug at their penis, respectively. Post-sex Gib? Showers with her boobs out, because now that we finally got a post 9-11 Freddy movie, it's important to remember that gratuitous white female nudity is the best way to fight against terrorism. And to be fair, we did totally win that war by not respecting anybody's privacy. Anyway, while Gib fights the good fight, Jason obliterates Trey's ass, which is probably also a 9-11 metaphor, though I am unsure how. Then Jason folds Trey up like a taco, and I'm not sure which part of the metaphor that is, but if you know the answer, sound off in the comments so we can defeat terrorism with our titties together. <laughs> And everybody who isn't a taco runs out of the house and flags a cop. Then other cops show up and they're like, ah, oh, it's probably Freddy. And they take Lori back to the station where she immediately falls asleep because again, these kids fall asleep like I take shits frequently, without warning, and with dire consequences. <laughs> She sees a sad little girl who has no eyeballs and then more jump rope kids and then she does what most of us do every damn day and wakes up. Then Blake's dad is like, what the hell were you doing not watching your sister at home? And Blake is like, dad, my friend died. We don't have time for this. So his dad walks away and Blake, well, he falls asleep. He just saw his friend folded up like a damn taco and he's just gonna take a nap like 20 minutes later. You're not worried about something? Blake sees Freddy and he sort of ghost attacks him, but it doesn't work because he's still not strong enough. But thankfully, Jason is strong enough for the both of them. And he cuts off Blake's dad's head and then slashes Blake himself all to sh Next, we've got the aforementioned Will, who is in some sort of psych ward. He decides he wants to escape because he saw on TV that somebody was killed in Lori's house, and a few years ago, Will saw Lori's dad kill Lori's mom, and he's worried the dad did it again, but to Lori. Will's friend, named Mark, who does not play checkers, damn it, go grab the fucking Uno deck, and we'll play, okay? Helps Will escape with a little male nudity for once for the ladies and some fellas. We don't judge here. The next day, Lori's dad tries to slip some hypnosil into her juice, but she won't drink the juice. Just drink the juice, Lori. Drink your juice. And she wakes up at school where some kids are handing out literal flyers for an underage drinking party because that's the most effective way to get the word out about your underage drinking party. Cops would never think about checking the flyers. And Will shows up with Mark and Mark yells a bunch of shit at Lori about Freddy and what he does, and then Lori passes out in classic Springfield fashion. While she sleeps, Kia wants to know when Lori's gonna wake up, but the nurse angrily shushes her like Lori's taking a nap instead of having literally passed out in the hallway. And then Kia herself, I, I assume, falls asleep because Freddy kind of rips her nose off. But it does, but not like, just, she just thinks her nose is ripped off. It's not, it, her nose is still on. Will and Mark drive to the library in Mark's dead brother's titty van and realize basically all evidence of Freddy Krueger has been wiped from the record. The entire town intentionally buried his existence because they understand Freddy has no power if nobody knows who he is. And Mark realizes, oh, shit. 
I've been telling literally everybody about Freddy's that bad. <laughs> I don't want to spoil anything. But it's pretty bad. Will says, whatever, let's just go grab Lori and get out of here. And now they're all at a shitty cornfield rave. And some dweeb kid named Charlie is a total a to Kia and tells her she can't think good because her head is weighed down by makeup, which killer line. But this is also back in a time when writers believed that sort of thing would turn women on. So the two dance. Young love. And then Gib wanders off and sees Trey's in the corn, even though he's dead, and chases him. Naturally, she ends up in a silo with faces coming out of the metal and shit because Freddy's there naturally. But in reality, she is in fact passed out. A fact not lost on this shitty glow sticked ass who tries to sexually assault Gib amidst the corn. Before Freddy can kill her or the glow stick guy could pull a sanctuary but with a glow stick instead of a corn cob, Faulkner reference for all you kids out there, Jason stabs them both, which upsets Freddy greatly because stabbing is really his thing. Then Jason just starts massacring teenagers even after being set on fire. The main characters barely escape in the titty van though and Will takes a few of the characters home but he warns Lori that her dad is the one that got him committed and maybe murdered her mom. I don't remember where to put this, uh, but at some point it's revealed that Will did not actually see Lori's dad kill Lori's mom. That was Freddy killing the mom in a dream. So just insert that somewhere that makes sense. She escapes her dad and house and her and Will go to grab Mark, who is at his parents' house, I guess? Are they not surprised to see him considering as far as they know, he was in a mental institution like yesterday? I don't know, but Mark is about to fall asleep as one does. So he tries to take some meth pills, but drops them and is immediately haunted by his dead scut of a brother. <laughs> Apparently Ralphie came back to finish the job because scut is positively swimming in nose blood. <laughs> Will and Lori show up just in time for Freddy to set Mark on fire and burn Freddy's back into Mark's back, even though that doesn't really make any sense to these kids because they're just learning about Freddy for the first time right now. But I guess really any message burned onto a back is pretty scary. It could have been the chicken and chili menu at Wendy's branded onto his skin and he would still be fairly unsettling. At least at the Wendy's that we have, there, there's like, you know, menu subheaders and there's a chicken and chili menu and it's just chicken nuggets and chili. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you're getting. <laughs> but it's like, they also have chicken sandwiches, but they, that's not under the chicken and chili menu. It's just chicken nuggets, and we also have chili. Thus, this is the chicken and chili portion of our menu. Whatever, the cops say they're gonna set up some roadblocks so nobody can leave the town and they can contain Freddy because they've had four years of peace and they're gonna get it back, damn it. But that means this is set four years after the sixth movie, which makes sense since that technically took place in 1999 and this movie came out in 2003, but every single child in the town was dead in that movie. And every single adult was insane. It was for all intents and purposes, a ghost town. Hell, it was so bad, Rosie O'Donnell lived there. This time I swear it'll be different. So you're saying that in four years, every adult became mentally stable again and birthed enough children to repopulate the town with a bunch of teenagers? That math doesn't make sense unless they stole a bunch of children from neighboring towns or forced a bunch of complete families to move to Springfield. No matter how you look at it, it's an impressive bit of local cooperation and grassroots organization to steal children. <laughs> Would you like to come and live with us? Anyway, the cop from the beginning shows up in the kid's basement and is like, hey, I want to help. Whereas all the other cops think that you're being solely attacked by Freddy, I think you're being attacked by Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th films. <laughs> oh my god! Then he helpfully recaps that series, though I probably would have done it way better. Then these apparently brilliant kids piece together that Freddy, a serial killer whose existence is wiped from all official records and who kills people in their dreams, must have somehow used his power to resurrect Jason to scare people enough to allow Freddy to grow back enough to, to get stronger to kill people himself. That is shockingly accurate. Then Lori falls asleep, so everybody starts licking her and kissing her and stuff. Then when she wakes up, turns out that she's pulled off Freddy's ear, leading them to the realization for the hundredth time that they can pull things out of dreams. So they concoct a plan to pull Freddy out of the dream world and force him and Jason to fight, which is as good as any plan 
I guess. But to do that, they need to combat the fact that they fall asleep every 10 damn seconds. So they head to the psych ward to grab some hypnosil, which is apparently not FDA approved yet, even though it's been around for at least 20 years at this point. Now, I don't think they're gonna approve it, guys. Anyway, apparently this is the most high-tech asylum in the world with its own NASA control center. And there's a, they've got a bunch of minority report precogs, presumably attempting to see the future of this franchise's box office earning potential. They scrounge around for hypnosil, but then the pothead guy gets, you know, high and sees a truly shitty looking CG hookah smoking centipede thing, which he follows and then is attacked by it, which causes him to pour the hypnosil down the drain. That's why you never chase uh, uh, a hookah smoking centipede. <laughs> then Jason shows up and kills the cop in a truly shocking way, am I right? <laughs> But before Jason can kill all the other non-virgins, the Freddy Pothead injects Jason with some tranquilizers, knocking him out. Before he goes down, the Pothead is cut in half, but that was a risk Freddy was willing to take. Then Jason fights Freddy in his dream, and the kids tie Jason up and drive to Crystal Lake, so when they pull Freddy out of the dream, the two of them can fight on Jason's home turf, because even though Jason has murdered 20 kids in this movie, they're still more afraid of Freddy. And since Jason is unconscious, Freddy attacks him in his dreams and pretty much kicks his ass using force powers that he apparently has. And also, speaking of, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Once they get close enough, they give Lori tranquilizer so she'll fall asleep and be able to grab Freddy and pull him out, but like, uh, are they gonna be able to wake her up? They're using tranquilizers. Simultaneously, Freddy stabs Jason's brain, which allows him to access his memories of the time that he died, I guess. Uh, and then in that dream memory, Freddy tries to drown freaky 11-year-old Jason in there, but then Jason apparently wakes up because the van crashes. He also tries to, to have sex with a, a woman, but that's really more for us, I think, the audience, than for Freddy. The kids run away, but twist! Lori can't wake up yet. And also, she's being chased by Freddy in the dream. Jason finds them and starts trying to kill everything, despite the dweeb kid's best efforts to go full patriot Mel Gibson on his ass. <laughs> And then Lori gets burned and wakes up and pulls in Freddy, and then the music gets real butt metal as the promise of the movie's title finally comes to fruition. But only for a moment, as they soon realize both their moms were named Pamela, which causes them to lay down their arms. Just kidding. They kill the dork, and Freddy inexplicably reveals that he's racist. Dark meat. But it's okay, because Kia is homophobic. What kind of it runs around in a Christmas sweater? And also dead. <laughs> Jason and Freddy get to fighting again, and realistically, how much force can Freddy really get behind those strikes? I get that he can do a lot of damage with a stab, but even with knives in the palm of your hand, it's tough to do that much slash damage, because you just can't get the torque of, say, a machete. But whatever, they're fighting and shooting torpedoes at each other, I guess, and it looks like Freddy's gonna die, but then actually, it looks like he kills Jason, but then Jason rips him apart, so I guess Freddy dies, but then the dock explodes, so I guess they're both dead. But then twist, Freddy is alive, so I guess he he won, but then, oops, Jason is alive and stabs him and falls back in the water. So maybe Jason is dead now. And then Lori kills Freddy again. And then Jason dies again. And okay, so Jason isn't dead, but he's carrying Freddy's severed head. So, oh, no, he's alive too. So they're, they're both just alive. So I guess in the end, nothing at all happened. Sorry about that. All good. Yeah, and then I think we should do Wes Craven's new nightmare, but I don't know what the joke setup should be. Something meta, right? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, you always have the best ideas, Dave. Thanks, bitch. No, what? Wait, what? <sighs> I hate everything. Sick f Apparently, Wes Craven's got a new nightmare, and it starts in a forge-type area with an anvil and everything. Somebody's building metal robot Freddy Claus, and a dude's hand gets cut off, and it's actually revealed that this is a movie set, presumably for a new nightmare movie. To that end, we see Nancy from the first and third movies, but she's being referred to by the actress's real name, Heather Langenkamp. She's joined on set by her real-life husband, a special effects dude named Chase Porter, although he's played by an actor, and joined by their son, Dylan, who isn't real, in any universe. All of a sudden, the robot hand comes to life and starts slashing people, but then Heather wakes up in the middle of an active earthquake. Everybody's fine, except Chase's hand is cut in the same spot as in the dream, and Dylan is eating freaky ass oatmeal. Heather mentions she's been receiving harassing phone calls from some sort of stalker who is a huge Elm Street fan, and they've resulted in some scary nightmares for her in real life. Chase is like, 
Yeah, that does suck. Well, I'm off to film a soap commercial for two days. I think I can survive two days in Palm Springs, supplying soap bubbles for a detergent commercial. He didn't. And Heather punishes him for leaving her during this important time with just a brutal slap across his ass cheeks. <laughs> Then there's another earthquake. LA, all right, Dave? And Heather finds Dylan watching the first Elm Street movie and he loses his damn mind when she turns it off. But like, it's not that good, kid. Calm down. <laughs> Heather heads off to an interview, leaving Dylan with his babysitter, Julie, who probably shouldn't be watching children with such a filthy mouth. Sick fuck. Heather's got a real creepy limo driver, which would presumably get you fired pretty quick considering how many celebrities he presumably drives, but also he's slow because Heather is nearly late to that interview. Okay, 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 okay. okay so now she's doing the interview, which is tied to the 10th anniversary of the first movie, when, surprise, Robert England, the actor who plays Freddy, shows up to surprise her and the audience. Also, Heather is asked at some point if she lets her kid watch her movies, and this comes up like 15 times, and I think Wes is a little insecure about children watching his movies for some reason. Anyway, after the interview, Robert and Heather catch up briefly, though it seems like he's a lot more famous than her and Heather gets a phone call about a meeting over at New Line Cinema with Bob Shea, the actual producer of the Nightmare on Elm Street films in real life. One of the advantages of having a movie as meta as this is that half the scenes include some moron who isn't an actor at all. This is one of those scenes. I guess evil never dies, right? Bob tells Heather that director Wes Craven is writing a new movie which apparently means he's having nightmares again. Heather tries to turn it down, but Bob is like, you know, your husband is already working on a cool new glove. And Heather is like, well, that was sneaky of him. But whatever, Dylan is again losing his freaking mind and somebody has clawed his dinosaur toy, which he claims is the last line of defense between his toes and a freaky old man under his covers, which, I mean, I hope you have a better option than just a stuffed dinosaur doll if there are creepy old men in your bed. But hey, at least. Rex is not going to die. Heather calls Chase to say Dylan is crazy and acting like Freddy, weirdly, and Chase is like, fine, I'll come home. And as you might expect, Chase falls asleep while driving. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Because even people just associated with these movies have 7 p.m. bedtimes like my own children. Naturally, Freddy tries to get that dick and then definitely gets that chest, causing Chase to crash. I assume to death. He really does. He really goes for that dick. Really? It's, I'm not, I didn't, it's not a joke, Dave. He goes for that dick. While they wait for Chase to presumably never come home. He didn't. Heather and Dylan read Hansel and Gretel, which Dylan knows by heart, like a little freaking weirdo. The witch is dead. Then they go to bed and they are woken by the police saying, yeah, Chase is full on dead. He got that dick. Freddy got Chase's dick. And Heather wants to see the body though, because I don't know, maybe she wants that dick too? Is that? Is that joke too gross? Anyway, Heather somehow just walks into the morgue or something and nobody stops her because even though there are like seven exposed dead bodies just lying around, nobody's very worried about visitors. Heather gets a guy to show her Chase's uh, body and uh, he looks pretty dead to me. He's also got a big old scrapey scrape on his chest, which I assume is unusual for truck crashes, but I don't drive trucks. Now she's at this windy funeral and another earthquake happens and she smacks her dome, which instigates a brief nightmare sequence where Freddy drags Dylan into the coffin and chases a real dick bag, but then she's woken up by her actor daddy from the first movie. The night is rough, once again, but not in any particularly interesting ways other than Dylan and Heather having a discussion about heaven and God and the problem of evil, but that's been dutter. Daughter. But that's been done much better in my video about the God's Not Dead movie franchise. So why not just plug that right here? Can we do that? I don't think we actually can. I don't think we can put links in there anymore. The next day, Daddy Actor and Heather hang out at a playground discussing whether she and or Dylan are crazy, while notably not at all watching Dylan to see if he's... I don't know, scaling a massive toy rocket ship he intends to leap from to his death. And as her son prepares to literally kill himself, Heather admits that her greatest fear is that she is crazy. Which is interesting, considering her husband just died and her son is about to die. I would think those would be much scarier, but then again, I love my partner and children, so what do I know? Dylan hot rods off the spaceship, but is somehow miraculously caught in midair by Heather Langenkamp, stunt professional. Dylan basically says he jumped because he wanted to go to heaven. Can't argue with that. They head home and Heather calls Robert, but he's painting some crazy sh like a post-presidency George W. Bush. He also mentions that what's happening to Heather sounds an awful lot like the script Wes Craven is writing. Weird.
Later that night, Heather is attacked by Freddy, and when she wakes up, Dylan also attacks her with a shitty homemade Freddy glove. And of course, Heather also wakes up from that, and man, where is Leo DiCaprio when you need him? The phone rings and licks Heather and then Dylan pukes and flips out and she's like, okay, let's take this kid to the hospital, which she probably should have done sometime around his literal suicide attempt. Better late than never, I guess. While there, Heather pulls a terrible mom move and tells Dylan that he can't leave the hospital until he stops being crazy. Unfortunately, the nurse believes that Dylan has schizophrenia. You know, that thing that everybody chooses whether to have or not. Heather abandons her only child and drives to Wes Craven's house to be like, hey, so about that script you're writing? Really wish you hadn't murdered my husband. Also, can you like stop writing it or finish it or something? And Wes is like, okay, so here's the deal. There's an ancient supernatural evil that roams the earth or whatever, but every once in a while, somebody writes a horror story that really slaps and contains the evil for a while. Naturally, the Elm Street series, yes, all six movies were life changing changing enough stories that the essence of evil was captured for a while, but now the movies are finished, so the evil has been released and is haunting Heather because she defeated it in the first movie, and she's like, okay, I'm not Nancy, and Wes is like, yeah, but this ancient evil is stupid as shit and can't really tell the difference between you and, and Nancy, and besides, you're the one who gave Nancy all that power. Furthermore, this evil just loves the Elm Street films, so it's actually retaining the Freddy form while entering the real world. But of course, for all this to succeed, the evil has to get by a gatekeeper, which unfortunately, Heather, is you, I guess. Of course, also, this is all in Wes Craven's script that he's actively writing, and he thinks the only way to contain the evil is to finish the script and make another movie and have Heather play Nancy one last time which is a hell of a way to recruit somebody for your dumb horror reboot. At this point, I think Heather would be like, alternate idea, set the script on fire. Don't add anything to it, so maybe it stops, or maybe just write, and then Heather was never haunted again, and also Chase didn't die, and she rode that dick in the middle of an earthquake, and it was super cool. <laughs> But no, here's Wes's computer where we see that literally everything that's happening is in script form. She also begs the question, what happens in between scenes? Like, is Heather just appearing at Wes's house or does the script technically include every second of travel time? Is she experiencing her life like we experienced it in the movie, like in bursts? Or is the script only covering some of her life? These are important questions. I mean, not really, nothing. Matters. Heather goes home and Freddy appears in a dream, calls her Nancy and slashes her. She then wakes up and heads to the hospital to check on Dylan and Julie is there too. And it turns out they've put Dylan in an oxygen tent. The nurse patches up Heather and chastises her for probably showing Dylan her movies. And Heather's like, I didn't show him the movies. He just knows who Freddy is because every kid knows who Freddy is. He's as popular as Santa. And like, again, Wes, your movies are fine, but they're not that great. Calm down. Wes, also I'm sorry for your death. Whatever you want to call it. Heather finally sees Dylan who starts puking and almost getting murdered by Freddy, but get this. It was a dream! Dylan seems to be fine, generally, so Heather heads home to grab Rex because that's as good a plan as they've got, and she asks Julie to watch Dylan and not let him fall asleep, but the cops immediately grab Heather, forcing Julie to go freaky nuts and beat the sh** out of the nurses. <laughs> They still stick Dylan with sleepy drugs though, and Freddy murders the hell out of Julie in a way reminiscent of Freddy's first kill, you know, way back when. Dylan is seemingly not pleased by these events, and he escapes. Then Heather comes in and elbows a nurse in her vagina and calls her actor daddy for help. She chases Dylan to the freeway, but the kid crosses while Freddy appears in the clouds to just kind of like make things worse. And Heather gets drilled by a car. But other than that, everybody makes it across into Heather's house just fine. Actor Daddy arrives and asks to speak with Heather outside for a moment. So they leave her child, who has essentially tried to kill himself twice and is maybe possessed by Freddy and is the target of a supernatural ancient evil serial killer alone in the house. He'll be fine, I'm sure. Except, oh no! Upstairs, Freddy rises from the sheets like a boner pitching the most evil of tits. Lot chose to go pinch his tits. Excuse me. <laughs> but yeah, so they're outside and suddenly they look like they did in the first movie and actor daddy calls her Nancy and she calls him daddy. And is it just me? Is it getting hot in here? I love you too, daddy.
Heather goes back inside and finds a trail of sleeping pills that she believes were left by Dylan like breadcrumbs in Hansel and Gretel. So she pops them like a like a dozen of them, like me eating cheese balls. <laughs> And she ends up sliding into a tunnel under the sheets, which sounds like a complicated sex thing, but unfortunately is very literal. <laughs> she ends up in some sort of Freddy temple and sees a movie script on the ground, which she opens to this exact part of the movie. Then Dylan shows up, and then Freddy shows up, and then Heather stabs Freddy with a snake and then slugs him with her famously meaty fists. <laughs> and they fight, and then Dylan stabs Freddy, and Freddy chases him into a small fiery place, and Freddy can't fit, but he stretches his arm, but then Heather stabs him in the penis a bit, and Freddy grabs her with his tongue, but then Dylan stabs that, and they sort of knock Freddy into the fire room, and then they set him on fire, which causes the temple to forcefully explode, and they just fall out of the bed covers, which again seems like a sex thing, but it's not. On the ground is the script for the movie with a sweet little note by Wes, and the movie itself ends with Heather reading a story to her son about the time her dad was murdered by an ancient evil that was obsessed with their family because of his mom's career choices. That'll help with the nightmares. Oh, is this like a reboot? Pfft. Yeah, a reboot. Pfft. I mean, do I look like an asshole though? Stop lying to me! I'm not lying, lying to you! To I am not Stop lying, to lying to you! To I'm not lying to you! Alright, so like most late 2000s, early 2010s horror movies, the A Nightmare on Elm Street reboot pfft, starts with a long-ass credit sequence like a 40s Disney movie, only with creepy kids and also fire. So, Kind of like 40s Disney movies. <gasps> the main difference between this movie and old Disney movies, this is produced by Michael Bay, bitches! Freddy about to get exploded by a hot dog on a car! Eventually we open on a wet diner, and inside is a mean waitress who won't give this pretty boy some coffee. So he heads into the kitchen, which is probably a major health code violation, but also they're burning a bunch of pigs and shit back there, so I guess they've got bigger health. Yeah. Then we get a classic Freddy hand shot and slice, dude's awake. He apparently fell asleep eating a bloody face steak and his waitress named Nancy <laughs> tells him to stop falling asleep, dude, like seriously. Also, it turns out that his hand is cut IRL, which is no bueno. Then a different, hotter girl named Chris comes in and talks to the boy whose name I literally cannot remember and refuse to look up. I'm just here to meet Dean. <laughs> Oh. And then three other bros elsewhere just want the check, even though the sadder one, named Quentin, would also like a date with Nancy, but is too much of a Nancy boy to say it out loud. Uh. The less sad looking boy named Jesse slams some non-specific amount of money on the table and leaves. And then the original, probably mid-level sad pretty boy tells Chris that his therapist says that he's got problems from his past. And that's when the nightmares begin. And then he spills his coffee like a clumsy bitch and falls asleep. The he ends up fighting Freddy, which merely results and him slicing his own throat like anybody would when faced with such poor service. Nancy. I'm used to it. Now they're at the hundredth funeral I've seen in this series, but I'm not alone because there's a weird little girl dropping in flowers who has taken terrible care of her dress. But oh right, this was a dream because Chris passed out mid-funeral like a real piece of shit. She then looks at some of the dead guy's photos and realizes, hey, she's in a few of them, but as a little kid. But didn't they not meet until high school? She goes home and looks for more photos from that period of her life, but can't find any, and her mom acts real weird about it. Who can remember being five years old? She then heads to the garage to access the attic to find where she thinks the photos might be, and there's a legitimately super cool shot where it looks like there's a casket in there, but it's actually just the light reflecting off a windshield in the dark, and I very much enjoyed that. Thank you, Elmsley. <laughs> Then she's in the attic and it's creepy for many reasons, one of which being they still have a baby crib despite their only daughter being like 25 and still in high school. And also she's gotta be stressed out about how her shirt is hanging off her shoulder the whole time because that would drive me freaking nuts. So Chris finds a box and in it is the torn up dress that little girl was wearing earlier, which is weird. And then Freddy shows up of course and he says, remember me, but really it's more like, remember me, because it's played by the guy that played Rorschach in the Snyder Watchmen movie, which is actually way scarier. Remember me. And then Chris wakes up and I'm just gonna say it, this whole movie is way scarier and Freddy is way more intimidating. Call me a Philistine and set me on fire, but I will haunt your children with this hot take. Of course, caveat, the movie still mostly sucks a fat butt. <laughs> Anyway, elsewhere, Nancy sits on her bed doing literally nothing but listening to music, which is a thing I'm sure some kids do, but man, like read a book or something. What are you listening to that's so engrossing? My band? <laughs> anyway, apparently not, because she falls asleep and then the wall tries to give birth with god-awful CG, but it never quite 
you know, gets out there. The next day, Quentin points out his dad to Nancy, in case she doesn't know. Gonna be late to class. Come on, buddy, let's go. My dad. And Chris learns about how the ancient Spartans used to improvise all sorts of weapons and tactics, such as, apparently, eating enemy ass. Daddy. She falls asleep in the uh, classroom, becomes shit all of a sudden, and Freddy is there, and she screams herself awake, and the teacher is like, <laughs> Are you okay, Miss Fowl? Instead of just shit himself blind in fear like any normal human would after having an unexpected scream like that in a quiet classroom. Chris heads home and her mom is leaving because she's a flight attendant and again her daughter is definitely old enough to stay by herself in that house and should probably have a job and should probably, I don't know, be on social security. That night, Jesse crawls in through the window even though there are no parents in the house and he's like, look, I'm having bad dreams too. And Chris is like, can you spend the night with me? Which, as a father of two girls, is my nightmare. <laughs> Chris wakes up and chases her literally Rufus named dog outside and what do you know, Freddy kills it. Finally, a horror movie that thinks dog murder is bad. Look at you, Resident Evil. <laughs> Chris runs inside, but now it's a preschool with jump roping kids again and Freddy, and then she wakes up and fine. Here's her toe ring, you pervert. <laughs> she washes her face in the bathroom and then comes back to bed for a jump scare that quite literally made me jump. Found you. <laughs> for the first and only time in this entire series. She then gets murdered just like the first girl in the first movie, but it's kind of funny looking. <laughs> But then she's dead, which is less funny. But then Jesse runs away, which is kind of funny again. <laughs> Elsewhere, Nancy paints because she's a huge Van Gogh fan, apparently. And she's also a huge fan of drawing little dick people. Jesse busts in and is like, I didn't kill Chris. And also, if you die in your dream, you'll die for real. And the bad guy's name is Freddy. Then he jumps out the window and is promptly arrested because he is fortunately white enough to not be gunned down on the spot, despite being coated in blood. They throw him in jail, but he gets a roommate, so that's nice. And uh, he does fall asleep though and get murdered by Freddy, which is last night. Aww. The next day, Quentin and Nancy agree to meet, and Quentin does some research on sleep deprivation on the popular search engine Gigablast with its popular Blasted feature. He learns, surprisingly, that it's bad to not sleep? He then seemingly takes that Giga Blast to heart and passes out, which causes him to see a little girl who he follows, naturally, to discover Freddy, who is helping sub at a preschool, presumably because all the regular teachers are out with coke. Quentin wakes up and offers Nancy some speed drugs, which she declines, and then Quentin reveals that he's a Christian, which some say is an opiate of the masses. Now we gotta blame something, you know? That night, Nancy asks her mom if Nancy is somehow connected to all the kids who are dying, and her mom is like, nope, good night, no more questions goodbye good sleeping <laughs> i don't think so and nancy's a little suspicious nancy then sort of recreates the iconic bath scene from the first movie but not fully so she falls asleep and dreams about a school and gets licked by freddy so that when she wakes up she calls quentin over and the two of them tear apart nancy's mom and ultimately discovering a photo of all the kids together in preschool. Nancy and her mom yell about lies back and forth for a minute. Stop lying to me. I'm not I lying, lying to you. To I am not Stop lying, to lying to you. I'm not lying to you. And then the mom admits, okay, well, I wanted you to forget because some bad stuff happened. She explains that there was a gardener who lived in the basement of the preschool, which, first question, what kind of preschool needs a full-time live-in gardener? Were these children British royalty? But whatever. The gardener named, hey, get this. Freddy Krueger super love the kids but like really love the kids and Nancy's mom said he left town one day before the cops could talk to him about it and Nancy's bad dreams are probably just repressed memories from that period of her life Nancy and Quentin go outside and Quentin helpfully points out his dad again Quentin get in the car that's my dad. Because again, he's really worried that Nancy just doesn't know who his dad is. But uh, just so we're all on the same page, it's this guy. You got that, Nancy? My dad. That's my dad. And now Quentin rocks out with his cock almost out in a tiny little speedo at swim practice. <laughs> Some Christian. Oh. He attempts to swim, but clearly he sucks at it because he completely botches the turn, and then he starts drowning, but comes up in a shit abandoned warehouse. He watches Freddy run from a bunch of parents, and then ultimately gets set on fire, which probably means that the preschool weeds are about to be out of control. <laughs> Missy Mo. Then Quentin wakes up choking because I guess he fell asleep while swimming, which is something Michael Phelps 
would never do, this kid ain't gonna win Olympic sh While Quentin flounders around like a gimpy Finn Nemo, Nancy does some more giga blasting. She looks up all the other kids from their graduating preschool class and is bummed to learn they're all dead. Well, except for Marcus, who made a bunch of vlogs about his horrible nightmares and then maybe gets killed mid-vlog. But if so, who uploaded the vlog? whatever, Quentin goes straight from dicks out practice to confront his dad because Quentin thinks that Freddy was innocent, which is interesting because even if he was then, he's not so much now. What with all the murders and all? <laughs> his dad is like, chill out, bro. We did the right thing unless we didn't, but either way, dude is burnt, so who cares? And Quentin is like, ugh, parents. And he and Nancy go try and get more speed. The pharmacist says, On this, uh, you're out of refills. So Nancy keeps herself awake by burning her arm with a cigarette lighter. But, like, pick a less visible spot, Nancy. It doesn't work anyway because the drugstore keeps turning into a boiler room and she gets stabbed pretty good. But also, get this. She brings a piece of Freddy's sweater into the real world. Does this hint at a possible way to fight back against Freddy? <laughs> But while they ponder the ramifications of this exciting new development, they take Nancy to get fixed up at the hospital. While there, Quentin steals some big syringes full of adrenaline, which is pretty ballsy, and then he and Nancy run away before the doctors can give Nancy sedatives or something that'd knock her out. <laughs> they drive to the old preschool where they were so loved. <laughs> It's a little bit darker than I remember. But on the way, they see Freddy in the road and swerve out of the way so they don't hit him, but like, they probably should have. Now they break into the preschool, which should absolutely be the plot of the next Oceans movie. <laughs> And they end up in the basement where there are a lot of knives and shit. To be fair, a lot of gardeners cut the grass with knife gloves. So that doesn't mean anything yet. They open a hole in the wall, though, to reveal a secret room that Nancy kind of remembers. And there are photos of her that prove Freddy is not a great dude. Surprise, surprise, the weird-looking dude who liked kids was worthy of being burned alive without a trial or anything. That's why Crack.com is a major proponent of burning weird dudes alive. And I dare my boss to watch this far into the video and refute me. It won't happen. So anyway, they decide, get this! What if Nancy falls asleep, but Quentin stays awake? And then Nancy can grab Freddy in the dream, and Quentin could wake her up, and then if she's grabbed him hard enough, Freddy will be in the real world, and they could beat him to death, like a heavy Bible or something. Because Quentin is a Christian. <gasps> of course, Quentin, despite shooting himself up with literal adrenaline, falls asleep within milliseconds. Like, he falls asleep so fast, I think he actually might fall asleep faster than Nancy. Freddy slashes Quentin and then stalks Nancy into a house and she gets stuck in quick blood and sinks through a ceiling and now is wearing a little girl dress and paralyzed on a bed and look, I am all for making something creepy, but literal out and out attempted pedophilic rape is a little much. It honestly comes across more as disgusting and off-putting than actually terrifying. It just feels like shock content for shock's sake. This coming from the guy who has said come more than no times, which is too many times. But whatever, Nancy stabs Freddy to no avail, and then Quentin apparently wakes up and tries to wake up Nancy to no avail. Well, until he shoves a syringe into her damn chest, which very much avails her of wakefulness. Pretty ballsy of Quentin to go for the shove syringe into chest tactic, like a guy who got all his medical training from Pulp Fiction. Why not the leg? Or the arm? Why the literal tits? Was he actually going for the heart? That's insane. Anyway, Nancy pulls in Freddy, and the three of them fight a bit, and then Nancy slits his damn throat and calls him a bitch, because calling people bitches is Freddy's bitch. bitch. Then they set his corpse on fire, which is quite a bit of insult on top of injury, and worse, it's a massive waste of tactics taxpayer money. I hope you're paying those firefighters out of pocket, Nancy. Nancy and Quentin ride in an ambulance and then Nancy makes up with her mom, you know, the accomplice to murder, when, oh shit, Freddy kills her from the mirror. Man, parenting is tough. All right, well, you're done with the main stuff, but I actually made a couple little short, funny sketches with my friends that I'd love your feedback on. No, I won't do it. I have to wake up. Doesn't have to be a big deal, bitch. I think a few of them are pretty funny. Just, just looking for some, you know, honest critique. No! That was the last time I knew math in the bathtub.